Well, hello, and uh, firstly, on behalf of the Creavan Historical Society, I'd like to welcome you to this recording of our talk from the Canyon to the Half Moon, the slang place names of Lurgan, which was held on Thursday, the 8th of July. The talk was held in association with the Lurgan Townscape Heritage Scheme, a regeneration initiative supported by the Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which aims to repair, restore and regenerate a number of historic buildings within the Lurgan Town Centre, while promoting the history and heritage of the town through an activity and events programme, of which this talk forms a part. I should note that due to an hour on my part, uh, the first 10 minutes of the talk on Thursday were not recorded, as I forgot to re uh, press the record button, but I'm now going to provide a recap of that missing 10 minutes before we join the talk proper, um, as it happened on the night. I should note that this uh, talk is actually part of a wider project with the, which the society has been engaged in, which has been looking at the links between language, memory and place throughout the Craigavon area. This project has been supported by a kind grant from the Community Heritage Fund, um, distributed by the National Lottery Heritage Fund on behalf of the Department for Communities. And we wish to thank the Lottery and the Department for Communities for their kind support. Now, when we think about uh, place names, uh, townland names and street names automatically come to mind. Um, these are names which have an official status. They're names which surround us every day. And they've uh, garnered much um, interest and study from academics and their uh, local uh, history enthusiasts for what they can tell us about the history um, of the area, whether it be the topography or people or events or activities. What receives less uh, attention, however, are, are those more informal or uh, informal or unofficial uh, names, that is slang place names or colloquial place names or nicknames. These are names which um, exist on the tip of the tongue. You won't find them in directories or in maps. And they're therefore names which, which are far more at risk of uh, being lost, uh, particularly uh, between uh, generations. But like townland names and street names, they can tell us just as much about the history of the area. Now, we therefore decided that it would be a good thing uh, to try to record as many of these sorts of uh, slang place names uh, in Lurgan um, for posterity, uh, for, for, for people uh, to learn from. Now, why Lurgan? Well, I have to say, I haven't worked in Lurgan over the past uh, couple of years. One of the things that I notice is the sheer abundance of uh, slang place names which exist, uh, far more than, uh, than, than, than certainly I'm aware of in uh, Portadown, where, where, where I grew up. I'm not sure if it's a Lurgan thing or um, th there's a reason for that. Maybe maybe the ones maybe the ones of Portadown just require a wee bit more study or uh, to unveil. But I have to say, it is something that, 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 that I think is quite, quite, quite unique uh, to Lurgan. So we therefore decided, well, we'll, we'll start with Lurgan and then we can maybe look, look at uh, other places um, after. Now, so far to date, uh, we have um, recorded um, a total of 40 uh, slang place names, um, which we've re uh, recorded on uh, this uh, map, um, which was uh, put together by Keith Henderson, a very talented designer with uh, Doghouse uh, Creative. Um, You'll see uh, the map, each, uh, each, uh, each place name has been given a symbol reflecting its meaning. Uh, the key is at the very bottom uh, to, to the names. While on the reverse of the map, which you don't see here, there is um, a written meaning and a location, uh, location uh, for, for each name. Uh, copies of this map, by the way, are actually available uh, from Dan and Crafts in William Street and from JTR Jewelers in uh, Castle Lane. Uh, more details about that will follow at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, now, a lot of uh, people have uh, contributed uh, names uh, to the map. Uh, Jim Conway from the Craigavon Historical Society, who uh, will be joining joining us uh, in the recording uh, later, um, has contributed quite quite a number. David Martin, Tracy Price, uh, Donna McKeown, uh, Gary O'Carroll, um, the Clan McGill uh, Friendly Club, uh, Mark Dixon, Heather. Uh, Gervin. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's other people, uh, other people that I'm sort of sort of, sort of, sort of I can't remember their names right now. Peter Bunting, um, and uh, but but thank you to all all, all, all those uh, people for for contributing uh, to the map. Um, I should note other place names were actually acquired from uh, books, uh, particularly Alf, Alfie Talon's uh, Memories of Old Lurgan. Um, Alfie Talon uh, being the pseudonym of uh, Pat Smith, um, a noted journalist with the Lurgan Mail and the uh, Lisburn Star. 
Uh, other names were provided by uh, looking through articles that were written by the late uh, Karen Clendenning. Um, another, um, another, of course, past uh, journalist of the Lurgan Mail, Mail and a great, uh, great Lurgan historian. Now, I should note that although we've, we've gathered uh, 40 names, it's by no means an exhaustive list. Indeed, uh, I've already acquired uh, seven, seven additional names uh, since this map uh, was, was created. And uh, I'd, be very, I'd be very keen to hear from anybody out there who has other suggestions um, uh, for, for slang place names that, that are actually missing uh, from the map. Uh, the idea would be that hopefully in, in a year or so we can, uh, we can uh, produce a second edition of the map, uh, sort of an updated um, edition um, of this map. By the way, uh, the meanings um, as well, for some of the meanings are, are very obvious. Other meanings are a wee bit more unclear and they're sort of subject to speculation. So again, if you have an alternative meaning uh, for, for some of the place names, again, we'd be very keen to hear from you. So, so, so do get in touch. Um, through, you get in touch is actually through the Craig Adam Historical Society uh, website that they're the, using the contact us um, uh, 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 box. Now, I should note, um, when we talk about slang place names, as I mentioned at the start, we're really talking about unofficial names. You know, we're sort of, uh, these are names that, uh, that exist on the tip of the tongue. They don't have an official status. You won't find them in street directories or uh, on maps or in valuation books. And therefore, for example, we did not record, for example, um, the courts and alleyways, um, which formerly existed in Lurgan, which are recorded in this map here, um, which I think was created by uh, Lawrence Maneri initially. And uh, you'll find um, actually um, a copy of it on uh, the old Lurgan uh, Photos uh, Facebook uh, page. Um, these uh, courts, if you, if you look through uh, old street directories or um, uh, valuation sort of or la land valuation books, you will find these courts listed. So they were official names. Um, therefore, we did not include them on, on, on um, our map, you know, on our map for that reason. With the exception of two, actually, that you'll see, see noted here, uh, the Pluckins and the Brigitte, which uh, we'll come to later on uh, in the um, later on in the presentation. Um, th these do not seem to have been official official uh, names uh, for these areas. These seem to have been more slang slang names uh, uh, for these uh, for, for these areas areas. So. Um, that was sort of sort of our reasoning. So so we're really only looking names that, that sort of um, have a more informal quality um, about them, and not not names that have an official uh, character. So here we have uh, Lurgan. Um, so we'll see here. Um, we're going to be starting starting on a uh, Francis Street. Uh, we're then going to be in going into uh, the Thailand of Silverwood. We're then going to be going up north, um, up to Armsborough. We're then going to, going to be east into the Woodville area of um, Lurgan. We're then going to go down North Street, then into Castle Lane, up by uh, the Kilmore Road, right round to the Flush, Flush Place. We're then going to go into Union Street, into the town centre, then into Shankill, into Edward Street, down Parkview Street, and we'll finish at the old Port of Dine Road. So, we're going to be looking at uh, uncovering uh, sort of the uh, colloquial names uh, uh, um, of, of, of all these areas. So pretty much going in a, in a clockwise clockwise manner from uh, Francis Street. Okay, so what's our first name? Okay, so our first name here is the head of the plain. Um, and this was uh, the former uh, name given to the Francis Street area of the town. Now the name, uh, the, 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 the uh, street name Francis Street seems to have uh, come into being in around the 1850s. Uh, this uh, map that we're looking at, this uh, ordnance survey map that we're looking at, uh, dates to 1860, and you can access it uh, via the historic map viewer at the uh, at the uh, bottom uh, web address. It's a brilliant resource, actually, if you if you never use the historic environment uh, map viewer, you, it'll, it'll allow you to access the uh, 1830, 1860, and 1900 ordnance survey maps. And you can see how the town uh, has uh, changed, you know, you know, through those years. So this uh, 1860 map, so this uh, was created just after the name uh, Francis Street uh, sort of sort of came into being. Uh, but before that, it would have been known as the head of the plain, or just simply the plain. And you can sort of see why here. You can see it's the, the, the land itself is very very un, un, underdeveloped. Um, it's a plain of land with sort of slopes right 
uh, slopes at uh, slopes downwards uh, towards uh, towards the lock uh, towards the lock shore. So this is where the, this sort of term, the head of the plane or the plane, uh, comes from. It's still a it's still a term that is still used in Lurgan today. So so obviously this is this is a name that goes back you know, to to the nineteenth century to the early nineteenth century. But you will still hear people calling this the plane or the head of the plane uh, today instead of Francis Street. Another ter term you might actually hear as well related to the area is the heights, which is sort of refers to this sort of area here, sort of where McDonald's, roughly where McDonald's would be today. Um, and this is that sort of, um, yeah, this would be sort of the high point, high point of land. So it's high point of land that, that slopes uh, so, so sort of downwards uh, towards the lock and towards uh, the, the, Shankle, uh, the Shankle graveyard. So the heights and the head of the plain. And just to also note here, you'll note uh, marked on this map is a brick field. And uh, when we come to talk about the brigat, uh, you'll hear mention about a brickworks and, and brick making. So to just just bear this uh, brick field in mind uh, when, when we get to that point. Um, also of note, um, this area here, sort of at the corner of Francis Street and uh, what we now call uh, Parkview Street, um, where the church um, would be, uh, where St. Paul's Church would be. Uh, to, to, to a generation of uh, Lurgan residents, uh, this uh, area would have been, uh, of course, uh, known as the uh, Celtic or Celtic, uh, South Celtic Park or Celtic uh, race course, where you would have had greyhound uh, racing uh, happening, uh, cards, you would have pitch and toss, gambling, all, all sorts of things, circuses, uh, circuses uh, would have come here, come here as well. So, uh, so this area here known as uh, Celtic uh, Park. And even uh, before actually uh, it was known as Celtic Park, in uh, around 1900, uh, William uh, Gracie records it as Hearts Field. And these uh, would have been the hearts of uh, the Shankill, uh, Shankill area of um, Lurgan, who were sort of uh, involved in the sort of the construction uh, trade. Now field names are a, a different, are, uh, I mean, are a, a, another category, a uh, subcategory of uh, place names. There's all sorts of field names, I'm sure, that sure, sure out there in Lurgan, and then uh, maybe it's a uh, maybe it's a uh, deserving of a separate uh, project. So Hartsfield and Celt and then the Celtic, Celtic, uh, Celtic Park, and now of course you got St Paul's uh, Church, Church here um, proper. Um, so that's uh, the head of the plain. Um, so we're now going to uh, move down uh, Francis Street, or the head of the plain, or the plain. Uh, towards the Silverwood Bridge uh, to look at our next um, slang place name, uh, which is the Honeypot. And again, to uh, many uh, many uh, long time residents of uh, the Silverwood and the uh, Shankill areas of uh, Lurgan, uh, the Honeypot will of course uh, bring some very fond memories. It's certainly a name that's been in existence since since uh, the uh, since since the mid nineteen hundreds, pro probably earlier, probably a lot earlier than than, than that. It relates actually to this um, to to uh, a trackway which is hidden behind uh, the gate here that you can see. So we've got the house here, and then we've got the Francis Street filling station, which you can just about just see there, just just off the map. Uh, here we have uh, the Silverwood Bridge, and we have uh, the railway line which runs right along the length of uh, the Honeypot, which was a former uh, coach road, uh, an old coach road. Now the Honeypot, um, it. it it, I suppose uh, the, 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 it, it, the best way of putting it is it used to be a lover's walk, very popular sort of, sort of lover's walk uh, in the past, um, which I'm sure will uh, get a bit of a, you know, raise a smile of um, a number of people who walk uh, down it. Um, the name itself, um, as we've come on to in the presentation, uh, probably comes from um, the Honeypot Cottage, which, which would have been uh, um, at, at the end uh, end of the honeypot towards the Tagnavon side, Tagnavon side of Lurgan. This was a cottage which uh, belonged to uh, the Hewitts, uh, to Samuel Hewitt, which was called the Honeypot Cottage, and no doubt uh, gave this sort of uh, laneway its name. Um, now you'll be happy to hear um, we th this takes us up to um, the bit where uh, the, the 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 bit where I did hit record on uh, the talk um, as it happened. So we're now going to join the talk with myself and uh, Jim uh, Conway. And I hope uh, you enjoy um, you enjoy the rest of uh, the talk. So yeah, it, it's a, a, yeah a lovely place, and, and rem rem remembered we have. at the bottom of this we the old river, we river runs down there. Um, we, we called it the Hipney River, probably still called the Hipney River, and it runs through down through uh, Knockrammer there now, where Knockrammer is. It runs down through there, 
Um, you can see it up through Tegnavon. The river runs through Tegnavon. I think it runs. That's the same one that runs close to where the where the dump is, or where the recycling plant is there. In the island. Uh, uh, that, that's the same river. It runs just at the bottom of the honey pot. Uh, no, it's funny how you said there, but um, I was sort of kicking myself because on the place name map um, for the honeypot entry, um, I neglected to mention the honeypot cottage, and actually, um, as uh, Isabel mentioned it to me as well, um, and actually, uh, if we can get up here, uh, here's a newspaper advert, 1939, and this is from uh, the British Newspaper Archive, and uh, this is a honeypot um, going up for sale in 1939, so it belonged to uh, Samuel Hewitt. Uh, so this is where the name comes from, as you, you say, you know, the farm that was sort of at the end of it. Um, I sort of had it down actually in the place name map, as uh, as you were saying, that uh, it was the bees and the birds, more so the bees. Yeah, well, well, that, there, definitely was, there definitely was that element to it, like, you know, um, so, uh, but um, I don't know if it came before the farm or the farm took its name from it or not, but uh, yeah. I suspect that the farm did take its name from, it actually was the honeypot, if you, it was the old coach road, and um, it, you pick it up there at the back of uh, Haddington Manor. It, there's part of the coach road still there, and that would have run right across then those fields from from that hill at the back of Haddington, sir, or Haddington, which is actually called Shankle Hill. The coach road would have run right across there. And then right along. Um, and either the railway line follows the sort of the rough course of it there. Yeah. yeah. Well, then at the bottom of it, it bends and goes out onto the four down road then. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, no, I'll uh, great stuff. It's a lo lovely name, Honeypot. And uh, funny, when I was, when I do this, I was at Clan de Gale. And of course, Clan de Gale's just up from here. You know, a lot of uh, memories are, you know, by going down, going down the Honeypot, as it was known. <laughs> so it was. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we're, we're going to move on now. So we're just going to go over the Silverwood Bridge. And uh, we're going to take a wee look um, uh, just at, uh, um, at uh, this area. So it's uh, Silverwood House, where Silverwood House uh, used to be. A very historic uh, so, so, sort of part uh, here of Lurgan. Um, this is a lovely picture of the house that I came across in just the Gracie collection uh, today. Oh, um, brilliant. So um, it's, it's actually the first, I, mean, I think I've seen one photograph of it before, but this is, a, yeah. this is another nice one. So you can just see it there hidden behind uh, the trees. Um, uh, so this the, the doorway, there. the doorway and the front window there are sort of rounded. It's sort of rounded, but intently. Yeah, I mean it's um it's quite actually uh, looking at it, you know, given it's a it, it, it belonged to uh, the Cubbage family, who I think were uh, one of the main uh, gentry families in the town, going back I think to the late seventeenth century. Uh, but it's quite a modest looking house, given you know, given the you know the the, the gentry nature of it, it has to be said but maybe it was more spectacular inside and uh, it looks well, like they had, they had a townhouse as well you know i think the heritage program is going to restore it it's um bengal place yeah was their house it was a town this was their country house if you want to call that yeah uh, it's only like it's only well there's a couple of miles difference in them but they had a townhouse and the country house but the um the other one you're restoring as well was the same the uh, the Cairns house, you know, the, the, their townhouse was the, what's now the... the um, Foresters. Foresters. But they had another one out just as you cross the, the motorway bridge towards Akigal on the right-hand side. That was their country house. So uh, there must have been all the reeds to have a, a country house and a townhouse. A townhouse, yeah. So it is. Um, well, I mean, this there looks pretty, pretty idyllic, you know, if you want to get away from it all. And... Um, uh, so, so this was the home of the Cubbage family. Um, the most famous resident, or indeed the resident that sort of entered into folklore, Lurgan folklore, is Henry Croker Cubbage, of course. And uh, you mentioned there about uh, Bengal Place. And of course, the Cubbages had a big connection to uh, India through the army. And uh, Henry Croker Cubbage, he was a... Uh, the Bengal Lancers, would that be right? Yep, That's Lieutenant Colonel or something. In the, okay. In the well, Bengal Lancers. Uh, well, I mean, again, I'm sure some of our viewers are familiar with the story of Henry Croker Cubbage, but... Uh, you know, this is uh, your thing, uh, Jim, your tourist shankle. So you'd like to relate the story of Henry Croker Cubbage. The rather sad story, it has to be said yeah. about him. You know. Well, <clears throat> as you said there, he was in, he had been in the army for 33 years in India. And he, he, he wanted, he returned. That there was a bit of a controversy in, back in their history that uh, an Indian princess was supposed to have thrown herself into the sea 
and was drowned and cursed the family. But anyway, he returns and falls in love with a lady and asks to marry her and, and she says she will and then discovers something about him and turns him down. And he goes out there, you can see Coverage's bridge there. He goes out onto the railway lines and uh, puts his head in the lines and the train chops his head off. And it's 11 o'clock train which has the uh, a ladder on it. It's, it's a male train but has, has a ladder on it from from her saying that she would marry him. So his soul to this day has him resting. And he haunts the area, the graveyard as well. And uh, he can hear his chains occasionally. And you can see if you're if you're lucky you might see him carrying his head under his arm. Yeah. yeah. Stock stock of the rail line. Because of course his uh, grave was actually he was actually buried, wasn't he, right next to the railway line in Shankill Graveyard? Yes, yeah. it's the closest grave to the railway line in Shankill. Yeah. Um <clears throat> but, oh, but I think that was a coincidence because his family his family grave there is the closest one to the railway lines. Yeah. yeah that's where he's buried down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, one one of the famous famous uh, ghost stories there, and actually funny. Um, uh, a taxi driver uh, a few months ago, and I was in a taxi. He was uh, he 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 was telling me Cubbage's ghost actually haunted uh, the lands around Silverwood, and uh, this was during the time when all this land was uh, vested uh, during the Craigavon development. Um, to considerable opposition, of course, by a lot of the farmers, uh, the Hewitts, uh, who of course uh, took over uh, Silverwood uh, House, uh, the the Battle of Joe Hewitts Field, where they tried to blockade. Uh, the field to stop by uh, the Goodyear factory uh, being built. Um, but he was saying, he was saying Cubbage's ghost, uh, he was a uh, haunting uh, the, uh, the Kurgavan uh, development planners, you know, to scare them away. <laughs> so it was, it was funny just hearing the way these stories sort of transplant themselves uh, yeah. how they relate. Uh, but actually, uh, now the place names have got really you know, nothing to do with uh, the uh, uh, Silverboy House or indeed the Cubbages. So we have the Half Moon, um, which relates to. Um, a half moon shaped grove of trees. Would that be right, Jim? That's right. Yeah. Yep. And uh, what are your memories? You've been down half moon. Oh yeah, many the time we we were terrified of it because uh, there were people used to carry on like uh, black magic uh, rituals and in there, and you would have found you know if you came to, during the daytime you'd have went you'd find you know the, the pentacles and all carved on the trees and the fire where they had a fire and all the so. Uh, again, I was never invited to any of them, so I don't really know what went on. But there was, <laughs> <laughs> there was, there was uh, something strange going on there anyway. So I had these black magic rituals up there. It was at one time it was the whole fad, you know. There had been the same sort of rituals going on, um, you know, behind Bel- Belvedere, where Belvedere is now. There was a cavern or whatever was there, um, and as as you know, or totally before there was. Uh, you know, we found evidence of it going on in Shankill Graveyard. Mm-hmm. I, I think I was in the 70s, those, all those things was going on. I, those were the days of, uh, you know, the famous films like uh, the, the Devil Rides Out, all that, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think people had been watching too much of this, um, um, you know, spooky films or whatever, it is, and they started all. So it was, it was quite common in them days, in the 70s, these black magic coverings or whatever they were going on around the town. Yeah, well, it's funny, funny, I was talking to, um, uh, you know, a number of people, you know, who were sort of teenagers in the 80s and 90s, so they all know the Half Moon, so it was like a meeting place or a, yeah. you know, a drinking spot, I suppose. Uh, yeah, we came a drinking about. spot, all right, yeah, but yeah, so it is, I was but still always a wee bit scared of it, like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they, they maybe hadn't seen what I had seen in some of the, the earlier days, or like, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. okay. And then we have another one here, Paradise. And this was uh, again given to me by uh, Johnny Kerr. Um, so again, this would be he would have been referring to this, I suppose, in the eighties. And I don't know if Paradise was something you'd heard of, Jim. Was that one that you would have been familiar with? Not very, not very uh, familiar with it. But I assume it's the one. Uh, the only place I could think of was he was he talking about uh, maybe down the poor down road there, the, you know, where where East is. There's a bit of land there. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, sort of around uh, Cubbage's Bridge here. Um, oh, is it right? Okay. So it is because, um, like a lot of the land that was uh, vested uh, during the sixties for the you know development of the new city of Craigavon, a lot of it ended up not being used, and the land around here wasn't used, and it's sort of become a wee bit of a a wildlife haven. It's uh, quite marshy, you know. You get the I think yeah. the Hepinny, ha- ha- Hepinny, I can never say Hepinny, Hepinny, Halfpenny River, <laughs> uh, which runs uh, close by. It's quite marshy. 
um, lots of butterflies, dragonflies. So this sort of area has now become um, a wee bit of a wildlife haven and uh, it's uh, got the nickname Paradise. So if you're looking to go to Paradise, you need to come here to the boundary of uh, Silverweed and Tagnavon. This is where you'll find it. So it is. Um, so uh, a lo lovely name and uh, just, uh, just a lovely area. Uh, so it is. Yeah, we, 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 we reared a wee fox cub one time. Um, somebody had killed its mother and, and we had a wee dog and, and its pups had died and she suckled it. It hadn't, it hadn't even its eyes open when we got it and she reared it and it thought it was a dog. But my mother was on the radio talking to some expert and said it was cruel to keep the thing domesticated. So we released, we brought it out there one time and released it there where, where you're talking about and uh, it, it started running about, thought it was a dog out hunting and and we went then and went home and left it there, thinking that it would go back to the wild. Mm. And the next day, we went out to the dog pen, and it was that up in the dog pen to the rest of the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and then came home by itself. But if I see we took it, we got a, I think it was a Miller man or something, and he took it away to Caledon and released it there. But uh, a few a few years later, we were out around that same place with the dogs. Now, when it was young and it got bit on the back by an odd dog, and it always had a the uh, fox's coat is black underneath and it always had this black patch on its, on its back and we were right there with the dogs and uh, this big fox run in front of us and it was looking back as if this, it, it had recognised us but it knew that it wasn't, it wasn't look, no longer domesticated and it knew humans were probably dangerous and the dogs were dangerous mm -hmm. so it just kept its distance but it had a patch on its back so I, I'm pretty sure it's the same one that came back you know Good memories, because because really this would have been all country area, really going back, yeah. you know. So it would have been um, good stuff. And sorry, Don, I just seen your post, uh, your message there. So they used to have circus there visit every year. Uh, would that be Silverwood, uh, Donna, that you're talking about there, or would that be uh, the Celtic Park? Uh, maybe. Um, sure. Maybe come back to that there. This is actually the first time I've done a presentation on Zoom using a PowerPoint here. So it's uh, it's, it's uh, just uh, keep it keep it abreast of uh, seeing all the key and the questions coming in and looking at you, Jimmy. So it is so lot to lot to take in. Yeah, I think I think it did. Yeah, I think it was Celtic Park with the Celtic Park. Yeah, okay. Yeah, where the, where the, where the circuses went to. Yeah, excellent stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to head north now, um, up to Almsbra and our in the Thailand of Drumnacali. And, uh, to the ink pot, which is a beautiful name for a place, I have to say. Now, this is one, um, it's a wee bit of a mystery. Um, it was uh, said to us by Oni Doran, if you remember, Jimmy, that time we yeah, were yeah, over, over, a, over a year ago now. Um, and uh, it refers to this sort of, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, point, uh, this area here behind Bully's Hill, um, where you just see the wee uh, red uh, pin drop, or pin. Um, and... Uh, this is all my built over. So this is where Hunter's Lodge, that uh, new uh, housing development, said uh, being built. Um, I can't really tell you anything about it. Um, I say I need to get talking to Oni again, just as to what the meaning of it is, and if did, anyone did likes he, it. Did, did he say that Coach Road run past it or something? He did. He did. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I put he... in, Yeah. Uh, actually, on the map, I put in the rather lame suggestion, but uh, because the street here, if you look carefully, maybe if you squint your eyes, it looks like a bottle, an ink bottle. Well, that's maybe, maybe it, but I think there's maybe a bit more to it than that. Uh, so there is, because um, there is also a river here he runs, uh, the Woodville uh, stream or river, which sort of sort of runs fairly nearby as well. So it might have something to do with that. But um, yeah, this is one, if anyone can uh, shed any more information on it, we'd love, love to hear it. Um, so it is, but it's a, a, a lovely name, uh, the ink pot. Uh, so it is. Um, so hopefully in our second edition of the map, we'll be able to add a bit more of a meaning to it. Uh, so we will. Um, moving on, so we're going to move east into Woodville area of um, of, uh, of uh, Lurgan, uh, Vatican mm -hmm. City, and uh, the stones or the stone tax. Um, now, I was actually thinking for Woodville, we could have actually had as another uh, name for this area, uh, Greers, because uh, a lot of people know yeah. this as Greers rather than uh, Woodville. And uh, the Greers were a family who've been in uh, Lurgan, I think since the mid 18th century, they came to Lurgan. And uh, at the very center here, you'll see a big house. And this is a, a Woodville house that you'll see here. 
and uh, Woodville House, um, it, it, I think they say it dates to the late, late 18th century. It's a, a Georgian house, um, very spectacular piece of architecture. In fact, so good that it actually uh, featured as the cover of photograph on a CEB Brett's book, uh, Buildings of County Armagh, um, which given the competition, uh, it was no mean feat. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's sort of surrounded here by, uh, by, by lovely grounds now. Uh, Vatican City doesn't relate actually to Woodville House, does it, Jim? Can you kick us shed a wee bit more light on where the name Vatican City comes from? Well, it would have been the, the, the housing estate there uh, that was built um, in the early, I suppose, the early 70s. And because they were all middle class Catholics buying the houses there, uh, it got the name of the Vatican City. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's uh, the aspiring classes, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so Woodville so. Avenue and around there, like sort of more. Um, yeah. yeah, the first bit was built. Um, actually, that area had been in a, 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 an army camp during World War Two as well. You know, the, the Vatican and they had Nissen huts there, and uh, there was. I remember we get. I remember the we get lodge. There used to be a gate lodge there as well for for uh, prayers. Mm. Come right on to the Lock Road. Yeah. Um, but that's where the army was, World War II. That would have been the American soldiers, would it? Yeah, uh, American soldiers, yeah. Excuse me. Okay, because uh, I say most of this, uh, these housing states were really built in the late 60s, 70s sort of time. Uh, so this yeah. would have all been sort of, you know, uh, sort of the grounds, I suppose, of uh, Woodville House, uh, where the Greers, Greers were at. Um, so actually, funny, I heard Vatican City. I think it was Donna had mentioned Vatican City to me uh, at first. And... Um, I had it down at St. Peter's, you know, down North Street. Uh, and then uh, it was pointed out to me. I think you pointed out, Jim, no, my geography is completely wrong. <laughs> so, so it was, so it was. Well, you know, yeah. they actually found Bronze Age. See there, that Woodville Gate part of it? Yeah. They found Bronze Age uh, yeah. uh, burials or something there uh, when they were excavating there. Okay. And uh, they also found an early plantation, some from the early plantation as well there. That area, so it was a very, very, very important area. But as well, that coach road we're talking about, it ran then from uh, the back of Haddington through Greers and then out to the ink pot. And then when it ran from there, I think, to Anna, towards Anadraha, uh, you know, Anadraha Lane. Yeah. And, and ran that way and then uh, skirted Loch So that was the old coach road. Mind. Okay, so it's uh, good, good to see. It'd be fun to maybe try to trace the old coach road, wouldn't it? Uh, just it would be nice, it. yeah. Right I'd like to see it. I've yeah. tried to pick it up in some of the old maps, but it doesn't seem to be on them. Uh, um, I just way parts of it are. You know, you just you just make out parts of it, and then there's other yeah. parts just missing. Yeah. Uh, Donna, this uh, building similar to style to the Grace Hall off Cottage Road. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Darlingstown Grace Grace Hall, is it? Or would it be like that, that sort of uh, direction? Um, yeah, so it's a lovely looking building. I'd lo love to love to get to see inside it. Uh, forward, um, the stones and the stone tax. Now, um, this refers to well, I suppose they're, they were just stones, stone bollards um, that were yeah. sort of I think at the entrance to Allen Hill, Allen Hill Park. Um, yeah. And the bit that sort of confused me. So the stones is sort of you know. Yeah, that's understandable. The stone tax sort of sort of um confused me a bit because um uh, Gary Gary O'Carroll had said uh, he known them as the stone tax, as in T S E K S. And then I heard other people refer to him as as a, as the stone tax, as in T E C H S. And then it was actually uh, Jim when you were talking to Pascal, and then you mentioned there was a a building company out here, and that uh, there was a product called stone tax. And uh, so I'd done a wee bit of wee bit of digging, and um, I came up with this newspaper advert again from the brilliant uh, British newspaper archive, a uh, fantastic resource. And uh, I just typed in stone tax and Lurgan, and this came up. Uh, so this was a product that was sold by uh, Greers in uh, Woodville, so somewhere somewhere in the Lake Road, just just around this area, called stone tax, which was like a I think it was just an artificial stone. Uh, so this became another no, another name for the stones, and uh, and then as I said, it sort of got a bit mangled, and the stone tax 
stone tax. So uh, just just as people, you know, just as an everyday language, it's sort of the 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 uh, language sort of sort of morphs. So I was quite happy with that. You know, I was quite you know to get to the bottom of that <laughs> was. Um, and also, just when we're here, we should actually mention um, yeah, the Woodville, the car park in the Woodville. It has a rather darkly, darkly comic, comic name, I suppose, uh, called uh, the Wounded Knee. And this was a place where, uh, I suppose, punishment tax were, were carried out during during the Troubles. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's a dark, darkly comic, you know, that sort of uh, thing. If you can't laugh, you'd cry uh, type, type mentality uh, uh, to it. Um, there is actually another one along those lines, uh, the Gaza Strip. I have heard, although I haven't quite got the geography fit uh, nailed down. Um, I think it was, uh, I've heard people say Tagnavon. I've also heard it in Shankle, but um, I'll have to sort of uh, do a wee bit more digging on that one, Jim. I don't know if that's one you've heard of before. Well, the gas stump would have been a more modern one. Uh, yeah. Not sure about that now, yeah. I know the, the first pace lane, if you want to call that, and the whole of the Troubles was the Rector's Wall there, which uh, hopefully you're trying to restore. Yeah, and um, that that was the very earliest. That was before any of peace divides. That was was one of the earliest ones, probably the early, earliest one. But I can't think of the uh, the Gaza Strip now. Um, yeah, no, I'll say I think yeah, these these would have been coming from I suppose teens maybe in their um, uh, you know uh, six uh, in the eighties, uh, late seventies, eighties. Uh, so I'll have to get a bit thinking about that, but it is interesting because I mean, it's uh, when we talk about place names, a lot of emphasis goes on townland names because of their antiquity and what they can tell us about, you know, geography or events or people in the past. But these minor place names, I mean, they tell us exactly the same thing. You know, people, events, um, you know, buildings uh, that relate to the more recent past, and they're just as important to record um, as well because at some point they will become history and they'll tell us. Uh, people in 100 years' time, hopefully, about things that were happening and <laughs> in, in, uh, happening now. Um, moving on. Okay, so we're switching our attention or we're going to uh, the back lane. A uh, lovely uh, photograph here uh, from uh, the uh, Lawrence Collection, which is uh, held by the uh, National Library of uh, Ireland. Um, so back lane, Jim, you know where the back lane is? Yeah, North Street. I, um, no? Jack Green's, my wife's um, grandfather. And great grandfather had a wee shop there just to the left, probably for him with a wee girl's lane on, on something there. Uh, quite po- he had a furniture shop, believe it or not. Now, that looks like furniture stand out there on the on the road. Um, I'm not sure if that's out of his shop, but it was the name says Gamble there, but yeah. he had a shop somewhere around there for furniture shop. And um, so, yeah, that's it was, it was North Street. Yeah, so uh, the back lane was uh, the uh, name for North Street before North Street uh, came into being. Um, so again, North Street was was named named uh, certainly named North Street by eighteen fifty four. Um, it, it doesn't appear in the eighteen thirty um, uh, ordinance survey map. So again, around the eighteen fifties, North Street came into being. Uh, before that, however, it was known as the back lane. In fact, there's still people who call it the back lane today, and uh, that name derives from the fact that this was this provided. Um, uh, the the uh, access to the back entrance of uh, the Brownlow domain. Um, so this, uh, the Brownlows who are the main uh, landowners in Lurgan, who uh, lived at Brownlow House, uh, surrounded by a big mass of domains. This would have been the back way into it. And um, uh, see so if I can just come up here. So Jim, you'll notice this. This is the uh, the, the cottage. Um, yes. so this, would, this would have been uh, the gate lodge. Uh, that would have provided uh, access uh, to to the uh, entrance to the back uh, entrance, the Brownell House, which uh, would be past St Peter's Church here that we're looking at here. Um, this would be where St Peter's the uh, St Peter's Edge uh, Club would be now. And uh, this uh, was the home for a while, Jim, of a very famous resident from Lurgan. And uh, I'll let you uh, another one of your um, yeah. enthusiasts. Yeah. Uh, this well, there's a bit of conjecture over which. Um... Uh, which of the gate lodges that A's family lived in. Um, but certainly I've had two different sources. Uh, one one uh, uh, definitely says he lived there. And another one says he lived in the one that was on top of Windsor Avenue, but um, I'm not sure. But I, you know, we have seen records of him being registered as living in the one down there in North Street um, when he was going to school. He was registered as as North Street. 
Yeah, so this is our George. Yeah, huh? so this, is, this, this is our George William Russell, who um, you know went on. So he lived here at about the age of eleven, and then his uh, family moved to Dublin, and um, then uh, he of course went on to have a very significant uh, impact on uh, the cultural and uh, political and economic uh, life of Ireland, and he is a, a very renowned artist, a poet, journalist. Multi-talented polymath. That's the word, isn't it, uh, Joe? Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah. so uh, you know. Uh, I, I was reading somewhere that uh, he was also a statesman. State, state. Declared him as a statesman. Yeah. So, so this, uh, so this was the cottage he lived in, and I'm inclined to agree with you, Jim. I think this was the, the cottage, the North Street Gate Lodge, because um, uh, uh, when you look at the Lurgan Model School registers, um, he has registers living in North Street uh, during this point. And there was a gate lodge, and this is the only gate lodge in North Street. So, you know, uh, I would go with that uh, myself. Uh, but this, so this was uh, the back lane uh, gate lodge uh, that provided access uh, to the Brownlow uh, domain. Uh, just, just the other thing to note in this photograph, you can just about make out here the sign for Herbert's uh, shop. So uh, Herbert was uh, one of the Jewish uh, community that came to settle in uh, Lurgan uh, during the late 1800s, early, early 1900s. Um, other families, the Matthews families and the Robinsons uh, were among uh, the, the, the Jewish community. And then uh, North Street was very much uh, the area that, that uh, they settled in. In fact, I think there was a, I don't know if there was a synagogue, but there certainly was a meeting place, a, a meeting place uh, for prayer that they yeah. made down here as well. And uh, Herbert, yeah, I think it was, I think it was actually constituted as a synagogue because they had the, yeah. is the Torah, what do we call it? You know, the prayer thing and all there. So, yeah. But there was also Levine, of course, Levine, uh, Levine, yeah. Levine, Levine Rouge called after. Um, yeah, so, so, it's, yeah, so it's, it's funny. I think um, outside of uh, you know, Belfast, Lurgan had one of the, the, the largest Jewish communities. And uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, they, they sort of fled uh, fled to Ireland uh, after the sort of the pogroms that were happening in uh, uh, Russia. And uh, was, there was, a, the there was another family called Lazarus down in Silverweed. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Which I thought it was a great name for uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> I think the Herberts, they were the last family. Uh, I think uh, most of the, the families ended up going to Belfast um, as, as well, as uh, so they did. But uh, just, just a nice, it's nice wee uh, bit of bit of history there, uh, just just for this uh, area. Um, so we're going to uh, move down North Street, and uh, we're going to come to a building that I think we mentioned there uh, previously. Um, this will work. Yep, the Big Green Chapel. Um, so this is uh, the Foresters, uh, Irish National Foresters um, premises, but it wasn't uh, it hasn't always been uh, the home of the Foresters. Um, it was the home of, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Jim, uh, John McCoon or McCoon. Is it McCoon or McCoon? Um, I don't I, know. Um, <laughs> there's nothing in the town now, so I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, um, I, I think... Like, I like McCoon. I think it's a nice, nice uh, ring uh, to it. Yeah. Uh, so this was uh, built in 1863. Um, so, uh, John McCoon or McCoyan, he was a, a linen manufacturer and uh, who built the uh, Limited, or well, the Largan Weaving Company, um, which is better known as the Limited, I think, locally, which is not too far uh, from here in uh, Ulster Street. And as, as well as that, he built the houses at uh, Brownlow Terrace that you'll see um, if you're walking down uh, you know, towards the model school, which, which are rather nice. Um, most most of the houses that were built by linen manufacturers were of very poor quality, uh, but those houses were particularly nice, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for the workers. Oh, there was one of the McCann girls. He was a girlfriend of C. S. Lewis's uh, father, in when he was going to Lurgan College. Okay, she's right. Oh, that's that's quite a connection there to have. <laughs> and. Uh, I think there was one of the McCoons Mc Mc was actually a, a famous botanist in Canada. I think, I think as That's well. Right, yeah. Is it uh, James McCoon? Um, maybe I think it's James McCoon. Um, I know there's a value right there. You can maybe maybe help out with that one because um, it is something. I'd love to do a wee link, you know, because there's a town called McCoon in Canada as well, um, named after them. Um, so very good. But the Foresters I uh, took over the building in uh, 1930. Um, it had passed in, in actually uh, into the hands of the Jordan family uh, from, from the McCoons that it passed into the Foresters in 1930. Uh, there was a Foresters club in Lurgan from around uh, 1892, and uh, they were sort of moving from venue to venue um, until, until they finally you know, purchased this as their permanent uh, house. 
Mm. Um, it's pretty much a social club and a charitable uh, institution today. It yeah. uh, gives gives rise to the famous saying, uh, "What time does the foresters open at?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have to say, I'm also um, uh, and this is one of the buildings that features in the Lurgan Townscape Heritage Scheme, and, um, which is a scheme which is all about restoring uh, historic mm-hmm. buildings buildings in the town. Um, now. There's not much wrong with the exterior of uh, this building, but the interior isn't in great condition. And there's some fantastic uh, Victorian sort of fireplaces and cornicing and architrave and, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, lovely, lovely windows. Uh, so we're working with the club at the minute to uh, help restore um, help restore it back to what it would have been like uh, when John McCoon uh, was uh, living here. Um, so it, it'll be very exciting to see what, what that looks like uh, when it's uh, finished. It was utilised... Uh... I suppose you could describe it like a sort of nationalist town hall, the nationalist end of the town. Yeah. So a lot of the functions and uh, were held in it. And the volunteers, Irish volunteers, were formed up in there. Um, and then, of course, they all went to World War One. The whole, of, you know, and there was a solicitor rally. So it was one of the main people behind all that. So that yeah. that would have been really. Uh, if there was anything going on in that end of the town that was organised there, and that's where they had the meetings and things like that. So, yeah, I mean John, uh, John O'Reilly, that would be he was like a lawyer or something. Yeah. I think he was the, I think he was the head of the Irish National Volunteers or the Lurgan branch of the Irish National yeah. Volunteers, and uh, I think his son actually, uh, the son actually ended up joining up with the Sixteenth Irish Division um, there as well, and he uh, was one of those who. Um, Lost his life uh, uh, during the First World War, as Jim was uh, pointing out there. So yeah, yeah. he was a. I think he was a, new, a newspaper editor or a newspaper mm-hmm. writer in, in Scotland. Mm-hmm. He went to one of the big newspapers in Scotland and he wrote for them. But then when the war broke out, he went. He went to war, and he was killed there. It's, it's a very sad thing. Like yeah. there's a big monument to him somewhere. Oh, you're a mute, mute there, Jim. Yeah, I think there's a, mod, a, a monument to him in Scotland or something, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but a, a very historic building and um, so a lot of uh, trade union activity happening here as well. And uh, um, yeah, so that's uh, the big green chapel. I mean, the meaning's pretty, pretty clear. I mean, it's, it's big, it's green. And, you know, there's a St. Peter's isn't nearby, so it distinguishes it. And uh, um, so... I have to say, actually, it hasn't always been green. It's only been green, I think, since the 1990s. It was uh, used to be white. I have to say, I, I think it looks a bit better in uh, white um, with the, the coins uh, green uh, along the side. But anyway, I won't argue about it. So, <laughs> so it, is, it does give a rather nice uh, name here, a big green chapel. Uh, so we're going to move on now to our next one. Okay, Free Crow. Now, this is a 1930s postcard, a nice uh, aerial view of uh, Lurgan. Uh, or of North Street. Uh, so you'll see uh, the big uh, Johnston Allen factory uh, in the background here. Uh, Martin Capper. Oh, sorry, Martin Capper, John McCoon. Pronounced McCoyan. Okay, so it is McCoyan. Thanks, Martin. Okay, so uh, it's McCoyan, Jim. I'll have to say, so John, John McCoyan. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, so this is a, a, a postcard of a North Street. Um, but you can see Johnston Allen's big linen factory in the background here. We've got St. Peter's. Uh, church, but Free Crow actually refers to this field that you can just about make out here, uh, which is a uh, bounded uh, by Lower North Street, um, Brian O'Tarris, Grattan Street, and the other street escapes my memory uh, what, the, what the other street's called. But Jim, tell us about Free Crow. Uh, this is probably, I'd say, this has been a name that's been in use since uh, the, 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 the 19th century, and it's probably among the more famous uh, Lurgan slang names. So, what do you know about Free Crow? Uh, well, a lot of conjecture about the, the name Free Crow, where it comes from and all that. Now, there's a couple of different uh, um, explanations. One of them is that uh, the, the, field, the field that you're referring to was like a, a past, you know, pasture for cattle. You know, it was one of these common areas for cattle to breed in. So it was free. Um, but also, um, the... the, the the, there was a lot of talk about the, the crows. Uh, if the crows had, had went into Brownlow, into Brownlow Estate, the gardeners there would have shot them. But if they landed in where the free crow field is, there, there's nobody touched them. So the, the, it was the free crows, or free crow, that's where they were free. To, um, 
of course, from the middle and things like that, there would have been maybe uh, bits of corn and stuff coming from it so they could have fed on there and all. So there's all these stories about that. But Yeah, because um, as I should note, the brand new domain would just be the other side here of North Street, just off the postcard. Yeah. And then you would have the mill that's just past uh, the church here. Uh, so as you're saying, yeah. Yeah, crows would have been shot at either for sport in the brand new domain or um, stealing corn in the mill. Yeah. Uh, so once they reached here, they were free to fly. So that's yeah, that's a nice reason. But, but I have anymore. another theory, and and it comes from the Irish for the root. You know, the word crow means hut. You know, and I was, I was recently doing you know, a wee bit of research into the free school, um, which wasn't far from here. It was free school was just almost beside the Fosters there, and uh, the free school had four percent of their pupils. Uh, were registered as living um, again the wall and the wall was the wall around uh, the Brownlow estate and they were living in huts again the wall and uh, the the other story about the huts were the, um, the those uh, temporary huts as they called them or you know, they used them for in the ancient times for you know the pastor following the kettle and also set up these wee huts and they were just made of branches and whatever they can get you know, and threw over the top of them. So the word for them huts was uh, a crate, and the people living in them was the critters. So the, the the name of the poor critter came from those people living in the huts. So I think the word free crow actually comes from the huts that was again those walls. Okay, yeah. So uh, was it heat of the huts or something like that? Or, uh, the what, sorry? The heat of the huts or something like that? Aye, the free Maybe. part means heat or something, yes. Okay. Something like that, the heat. Of the huts, free crow, yeah. That's the Irish version of it too, but yeah. it's like a lot of these things we'll probably never know. But um, it's, it's, really, lot, lot, it's, really, eh? it's, it's you really just choose the one that you most like, uh, the reason you most like uh, for it. Yeah. So it well, is. yeah, I like the one, the Irish one actually, because it makes sense to me. You know, the the other ones where people shooting the crows and all, don't know, but it could be true. Yeah. Yeah, but it's uh, certainly it's uh, it's one of those uh, famous uh, free crow. Uh, just uh, answering the postcard. I think uh, Oliver Burns and uh, his research, he he went with the the grazing land there. You know the pasture. You know the pasture land. Uh, so he did uh, version. Um, but I've heard uh, other people go with the you know, the crows were free to fly over it. Um, your version thinks a new version uh, on it actually. So it's uh, yeah, it's good to see um, that yeah. you know well uh, you know. Uh, People from Free Crow are fiercely proud of coming from there, like, mm-hmm. and they will call themselves like a Free Crow man or a Free Crow woman or whatever you call it. And so it's very, um, what do you call it, parochial, if you would call that they are. They're very, very, very proud, uh, fiercely proud of uh, of coming from it, or if their if their parents came from it or something like that. You know, it's the same. People of Shackle is the same. They're proud of being Shackle people, and uh, so you know you would. Free crow, very very fiercely proud of their free crow heritage, yeah, you know. The free crow roots, yeah. No, and uh, why not? It's a, it's a great name. Yeah, so, so it is, and actually, so at times refer to this area, but sometimes it's now taken to mean Lower North Street or indeed the whole of North Street. Uh, you sometimes get it get it being referred to, but um, I should just mention actually, um, I don't, if we went past the church, um, would actually come to Distillery Hill. Um, so this would have been, this is where the, the corn mill is, uh, it's uh, half of which has sadly been demolished in uh, recent times. Um, but um, as I said, there's still half it's sur- surviving, so hopefully that will remain the case. Um, but it's, uh, uh, you know, th- th- these sorts of landmarks, you know, they do give meaning, you know, to, to, to the landscape and the history, and it gives us a connection uh, to that, that past as well. Uh, so it does. Um, uh, Ulster Street, yes, Donna, that's it. That's the street I was <laughs> missing there. So it was uh, Ulster Street, see the other street there uh, binds here. Uh, Ulster Street was said to be the first street in the town to have flushing toilets. Right, okay, <laughs> didn't, didn't realize that. Okay, yeah, well, I've heard that said now, yeah, we're sure not much here, but that's I've heard, often heard that. Okay, good, good stuff. Ulster Street, um, okay, moving on, not sure where we're next, uh, next here. Canyon, this is the one that started all for me, Jim. Uh, so it was uh, the yeah. Canyon. Um, so this is where St. Peter's GIA yeah, Club would be. So this is just uh, past, past the uh, St. Peter's Church. So again, on North Street. So there's quite a few different uh, names here in North Street. Oh, I just uh, jumped on there. Uh, so Jim, your memories, what, 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 what was the Canyon or is the Canyon? Well, the Canyon was, um, it was 
I, so I, I'd like what you said about the parties. It was full of trees and it had been left to go wild. Um, and there was, it was the wee back road into the castle or into Brownlow House. And you had the wee, that wee cottage was uh, derelict at that stage. And uh, so, you know, the young ones used to play cowboys. Cowboys and Indians was a big thing. Yeah. Uh, God knows now what people play, but uh, that's what we played when we were children. Like, and, uh, but the canyon was the place. That's how it got its name, the canyon, because the, 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 the generation before me, they would have been playing cowboys and Indians, or, and they called it the canyon. And uh, it's interesting that uh, A.E. loved uh, those uh, cowboy stories. You know, he would have bought the Penny Dreadfuls. Yes. Yeah. And he, he actually played cowboys and Indians in there as well. You know, and that was in the eighteen hundreds, like so. Um, it's, it's, it's like a nice consistency going through there, like. Yeah, there, there's a. I think in one of his works is is it uh, is it uh, songs and um, fountains? I think uh, he talks about reading the penny dreadfuls. Uh, so he does, and about how the colors sort of uh, yeah, just, uh, splashed out of the pages uh, to him, purples and silvers yeah. and stuff. So um, yeah, hey, Larry Breen. Um, we play cowboys and Indians in the valley. In Lurgan Park. It was the wooded area at the back of the tennis club and the bowling club, particularly from Wellington Street, Castle Lane. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Larry. That's, that's another name I'll have to add to the map when we update it, uh, the valley. So it is good, good stuff. It was. And actually, a lot, a lot of the names actually they do relate to playgrounds and play areas and uh, so forth, you know, uh, given as a, you know, people growing up in the town. So fantastic. Thank you, Larry. Um, so we're going to move on now to, yeah, oh, Lurgan Castle, uh, the big house. I'm sure there's lots of different uh, names for uh, Brownlow House. Um, uh, so this was the home of the Brownlow family from, uh, you know, the 17th century through to the uh, through to the late 1800s uh, when when they sold up and uh, left the town. Uh, the principal uh, landowners uh, uh, of Lurgan. Um, so what we see today dates mainly to the 1830s, uh, this very grand house. This is actually a rather nice postcard of it, actually, because if you, if you go up to today, it, it's sort of like a rusty brown, sort of orangey colour. Um, but that's just the way sandstone weathers. Um, so actually, when it was built in the 1830s, it, it would have been grey. Uh, so it would have been. Um, so you sort of get, a, get an idea of it, uh, what it looked like uh, when it was first built. Um, so it's, it's not so much when we think of a castle, we think of a defensive structure, which this isn't. Um, when the Brownlows did come into Lurgan in the uh, 1610, they did build a fortification. In fact, you were sort of required to as a part of the conditions uh, to getting a uh, land as part of the plantation. Uh, so they built a castle surrounded by a wall called the Bon, uh, which was uh, taken over actually during the 1641 rebellion. Um, and then the Brownlows uh, re recovered it after. And they would do have a sort of a representation of what the original castle would have looked like. And um, uh, oh, Patrick Dugan's uh, map. Oh, sort of going ahead. So Patrick Dugan's 1751 map of El Ergen. So it's like a wee sketch uh, of uh, the original uh, castle um, that would have been uh, here um, in uh, 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 the 18th century. So this, uh, so this is from the 1751 map. Um, the house that we look at today, it as I said, dates the 1830s. Uh, William Henry Playfair was uh, the architect, uh, an Edinburgh architect, who I think uh, the, the National Museum's is most famous. The National Museum in Edinburgh is his most famous uh, work. Um, a fantastic uh, piece piece of architecture. Uh, built out of Scottish sandstone, uh, probably as a tribute. Would have been right, Jim, and thinking that would have been a tribute to uh, Charles Brownlow's wife. Uh, was she Scottish? Yeah, it was to keep her in the. And the custom that she was, uh, her that she was a custom day. She was a. The, she claimed to be the last of begging, the begging tribe. You know, there were the uh, her father was the kings of the Isles of Scotland, yeah. and uh, I think it was the Isle of Barra. She came from beautiful Isle, um, and he brought her over there. Uh, that was his. I think it was his second wife, and uh, he built it in eighteen thirty three, um, but uh, yeah, the. The, there's a lot of conjecture over where the original castle was, but I think it, I'm convinced that it was in the same place uh, where Brownlow House now is. And George Brownlow was a wonderful man, by the way. He was one of my heroes. Um, he 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 uh, he was a 
uh, was worked for Catholic Emancipation and was uh, accused of being a traitor till his, his, uh, his religion and till his culture and things like that. And he said he, he did these things because of his religion and his culture, you know, mm-hmm. so very liberal man, um, good man. But unfortunately, he died in the, the famine in Black 47. And the, the widow, the dowager, Brownlow, who the house was built for, was very, very popular among the poor. Um, and she, she was the last Brownlow to ride in the mausoleum in, in Shankill. And it was the poor carried her, her coffin till the church. It's her, her popular she was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, a great man. And he would have been the first Lord Lurgan as well, wouldn't that be right, Charles? Charles Brownlow, uh, who built this yeah. uh, Brownlow house. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 when we were children, we were told, we used to be told uh, ghost stories about Brownlow house. And one of them was about his top hat. You know, the top hat used to appear all over the place. Uh, and it would appear and disappear, this top hat. Oh. And I don't know if anybody else ever heard them stories, because I, I, I think I've imagined them. But I definitely heard those stories when I was a child. But I imagine that David, uh, David Martin, and he never heard any of those stories. And he certainly said he has never seen the top hat <laughs> appearing. Like, so, uh, but that was one of the stories that, that I was told about, about Brownlow haunting, haunting the Brownlow house. Like, but, uh, I have, I've heard now of ghosts haunting Brownlow house now, uh, but not, not the top hat now. That's, that's, that's a new one. Uh, so uh, that, but then every big house has its ghost. You know, it wouldn't, uh, be a, it wouldn't be a big house without it. But uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned David there, so I mean, he's never been to Brownlow House. Uh, David does give a very good tour of it, and uh, it's, it's, it really is a an impressive piece of uh, architecture. Um, so it is. So um, I'll say the castle, Lurgan's castle. Okay, we're going to one. Like a lot of uh, these names uh, would be so, wouldn't be that well known outside of the areas that that they're used in but the back of the wall I think is a universal phrase I think that's known throughout Lurgan and, yep. uh, and again it refers to uh, the boundary wall uh, or a, a boundary wall of the Brownlow domain which is you know formed which now is uh, made up of uh, Lurgan Park and the Lurgan Golf Club uh, so uh, you, you sort of see it running here so any any instances around the back of the wall Jim uh, for you? Well, that, again that would have been a place where those the poor creators would have um huddled or built their wee huts again in the wall at times of people forget that there, there was more than one famine you know um, the, the Irish economy was always living on the edge and every time there was any difficulty at all a lot of people fell off the edge and so there was almost every generation there was um, a famine of some sort or another or um, terrible uh, death so the, the, this wall would have been built as an alleviation scheme for for one of those times, you know, they would give people work and, and, and that would have been the work to build the, the wall around the park. And of course, the digging of the lake was the same. It was dug, dug, it was dug out of way back in uh, Arthur Chamberlain Brownlow's time, which is the 17, 1700s, early 1700s. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there were, there were always those schemes for to try and help the poor. And the wall was built. And the pe- people, uh, again, uh, any time there was uh, hardships, they huddled against these walls um, for protection and hopefully maybe get some, uh, probably Brownlow, I don't know, somebody would have maybe given them some food, you know. Um, yeah. For the back of the wall. Yeah, Kilmore, Kilmore Road, heading out to Kilmore. It, it seems to have been the Kilmore Road was an important road um, because it, it was always um, very prominent. Maps and things like that, and uh, um, you know, a lot of the big houses. If you head, head out there or along the kill, certainly the, the Lang Tree family, um, who were famously Lily Lang Tree got her name from them, they had a big house out, out that direction. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of wealthy houses out that road, so it seems to have been a very important road. It was heading over really towards uh, Moor Lynn, and uh, Moor Lynn would have been a very important. Um, location in the ancient times. Yeah, and I mean, uh, this would have been a popular meeting place and lovers walk as well. And um, it, it's funny the things you forget that you have because um, on Monday I was sort of hooking through my books and um, I came across um, a volume of poetry by this man, uh, James Balcomson, who, as you mentioned, he mentioned Maura Lynn, so he is from Maura Lynn. And when he died in uh, 1946, 
his poems were published in a wee book called uh, Marlin and Other Poems by uh, James Malcolmson. And he actually has a poem in it entitled The Back of the Wall, uh, which is about the back of the wall. Now, I'm not going to read it all out because um, it's quite a long one, but um, he didn't have, he seems to have been frightened of the back of the wall for some of the activity that was happened. Um, so I'll just read out the first couple of verses of it here. So um, when returning alone at the close of the day, from my cousins were often I call, I was mad enough once to go home by the way that is known as the back of the wall. For often with joy I had rambled that way, ere the sun had descended from sight, but I find that the road that was pleasant by day was a pathway infernal by night. Had I only consulted some man in the know, what a trial I should have been spared, but alas it was otherwise fated, and so I went on, neither warned nor prepared. No journey will fill me with greater disgust till I near the abodes of the dead, and my spirit must pass from its chamber of dust to, to the river that all of us dread. I encountered no terrier barking in wrath and forbidding me farther to go. No turbulent torrent obstructed my path and I met no political foe. No highwayman stepped from the shade of a tree. No ghost came to war or implore. But it was not the place for a student like me and I'll travel, travel along it no more. So he obviously didn't like traveling by, by night. Now, why was that? So he goes on, uh, a few, skipping over a few verses. It was crowded with lovers who walked arm in arm or reclined on the grass covered bank and whispered the tales that are fuller of charm to the youthful than riches or rank. Their faces were hidden, the gloom being kind, and to me not a sentence they spoke, but their presence disturbed the high poise of my mind and the thread of my reverie broke. So onward I hastened and musing, I said, how intense yet how brief is their bliss. It would surely be proper to give them when dead for an epitaph something like this. He was born in the year 1903 and he went shortly after to Dahl. And you'll find his initials cut on a tree if you go by the back of the wall. Perhaps I am proud and perhaps I am odd and perhaps my own wooing was vain. But there's one of the paths in life I have trod which I don't want to walk in again. A brilliant poem. <laughs> so it is. Hey, who uh, so, the uh, person is that went to the doll? Uh, <laughs> so, um, as his name character, yeah. Um, so we'll have to have a wee look in the tree. So this, uh, as as uh, okay, James, this was a popular lovers' walk, obviously in the early 1900s. And I'm a wee bit sad again. I, I don't have that on the the meanings of the place name map because I would have liked to have referenced it. Um, so it is, but that's an uh, James Malcolmson's uh, more Lennon and other other poems, um, which which I forgot I had until Monday. So the back of the wall, excellent stuff. Um, that's me for poetry, I think, tonight as well, everyone. You'll be ha happy to hear that too. <laughs> uh, moving on, uh, this is one of uh, Tracy. So, Tracy Price uh, told me this. So, this uh, Turkington's Corner, um, this image, courtesy of Old Oregon Photos, uh, you can find them on Facebook. Uh, you'll find photographs pretty much of everything. A uh, brilliant site, uh, one run there by, by Wilson. Um, so, this is uh, the, the, the flush end of the town, so the south end of the town. And uh, this is at the junction of uh, Flush Place and uh, Queen Street. Uh, the name, as it's, uh, the name comes from, of course, the the, uh, the car show I'm here, Turkington's car showroom, uh, which was here from uh, the 1950s through to I think 1998. And uh, I'm sure there's loads of these in Lurgan, you know, long-standing businesses that sort of give them name, give their names to corners and uh, the places in Lurgan. Is there any come off the top of your head, Jim? And uh, newses is uh, newses is one that sort of comes to me in uh, Edward Street. Is there a newses corner or anything like that? Oh, well, just just newses. I said newses pub. Like, um, uh, well, you have the minister's torn, of course. Uh, you know, had torn up into Tyne Avenue there. Came from the Presbyterian minister. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any more to minute. Like, uh, I'm sure there was places uh, called uh, Oliver Burns has one down uh, North Street. The wee news agents. Uh, on, on the corner, but I can't remember the name. It's just McDonald's. Just, McDonald's, yeah, McDonald's uh, corner. I've heard, heard of that. So I'm sure there's loads of these. And again, if anyone out there has any more examples, you know, do send them through. Um, so this is a uh, Turkington's corner, and I think a lot of people would still refer to this as a uh, Turkington's corner, even though the car showroom is said uh, it closed in uh, the, the late 90s, and uh, it's just no longer there. Um, but but these sorts of names, you know, they do have a life life after, they do. Um, 
Oh, we're doing for time. Okay, geez, we're over time. Ah, Monkey Land. Now, th this was one that uh, took a wee bit of detective work. Um, uh, there was a, a few people uh, uh, helped help with this one. Uh, David Martin, uh, Isabel, uh, Ralph Hewitt, um, Eileen, uh, Eileen, uh, or no, Heather, Heather Gerving, uh, Mark Dixon. Uh, so a whole load of people. And the reason was there actually, it turns out there's at least two monkey lands in Lurgan, not just one. Now, it's a, it's a playful uh, sort of name. And again, it's, it's, it's one of these names uh, referring to a play area uh, that people remember playing in as uh, children. Um, it uh, refers, uh, the first monkey land refers to uh, this area, to the rear of uh, Trasnoway and Connolly Place, uh, sort of extending from where Hamilton's, uh, you know, the paper merchant's places, uh, sort of extending from here, uh, right up the Millennium Way, uh, just uh, uh, just to the back here of these uh, high street properties. And uh, I think there's a, there's a tire place or something in here um, as well. So, um, uh, this uh, was an area of derelict land, sort of in the 70s and 80s. And uh, actually talking to a few people, there was a, a man called Monkey Gates, um, who was sort of uh, 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 sort of uh, lived around here. I think he was a, was a vagrant of uh, some type or homeless homeless person of uh, some some description. So it's, it's possible that he sort of gave this area the name uh, Monkey Land. There was also an area where there were trees and stuff and uh, kids climbing up the trees. So this was a uh, Monkey Land. And the other Monkey Land is actually located... Um, where the present uh, hollows um, housing development would be, uh, sort of uh, going out there uh, to Guildford Road. And again, uh, I was talking to uh, one of uh, 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 Mark, who uh, mentioned that uh, as kids, they used to play on the sapling trees, uh, they used to try to climb on them to get them to bend down to touch the ground. Um, uh, and they, they just gave them a monkey line because they were climbing the trees like monkeys. And uh, he said it was all fine until the saplings actually broke and uh, you got a rather nasty thud uh, when you fell down. Uh, so this is uh, the monkey land, the monkey lands here of uh, uh, Lurgan. Um, so uh, I was quite happy because uh, uh, I sort of was determined to get this on the map and we did. Uh, so um, uh, that's uh, monkey lands. I don't think that's one you heard of, Jim, no? That wouldn't have been one. No, I've never heard of monkey land. Yeah, you know, so again, I'm very <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very. Uh, it's a part of the town I wouldn't have been in until, uh, till you know, the trouble started a bit. But you know, name yeah. name days, yeah. you didn't venture too far up into. You know, there was not as much cross pollination, if you want to call it that. So I would never have been that end of the town. Yeah, so it does. Uh, uh, it's, it's it's great to say you know times have changed as well. Uh, so, so, so it has. Um, but but yeah, and uh, as I say, I say, a lot of these names are sort of localized names. You know, that you wouldn't really know them unless you lived in the area. You know, as because I didn't live in Lurgan at all, all of them are new to me. Well, apart from one, apart from one, which I will come to at the end here. <laughs> so there's, um, but yeah, um, big church, not the most creative name, it has to be said, um, but it does the job. Um, when you say the big church, everyone knows the church um, you're talking about, even though St. Peter's is, is in fact, St. Peter's is uh, the tallest church um, down, down North Street. But uh, the big church is a uh, Shankle Parish Church. Um, that you'll see at the head of the town, and you'll see it in this uh, photograph, again, part of the Lawrence Collection from uh, the National uh, Library of Ireland. Um, there's been a church, really, at the, the head of uh, Lurgan since about uh, 1725, uh, when a church was built to replace the older church, which uh, stood in a Shankle graveyard, which probably goes back to at least the 15th century, maybe, maybe a bit earlier. Um, the history of it's a wee bit, well, very hazy, and there's not a lot of information about it. Uh, but this church was built when uh, Lurgan's population began to expand uh, in the late 1600s and the early 1800s. Um, although most of the, the church that we see today actually dates to the 1860s um, when the church was uh, rebuilt to again accommodate um, a larger population. Uh, the only bit actually that would go back to that earlier uh, church, you know, going back to 1700s is the tower uh, that the clock's in. Um, and if you look very carefully, you'll see a uh, the stonework, it's actually made up of like uh, various cobblestones and sort of rubble uh, sort of masonry, which actually came from the old Shankill Church and the student Shankill Graveyard. Um, so, so it's a lovely link, you know, to that uh, older uh, older church. Uh, the, the rest of the church were into the 1860s. Uh, when it was rebuilt, it, it did become, well, some people say it's the largest parish church in Ireland. Uh, I don't know if it, I don't know if it go that far, but it's certainly one of the biggest uh, parish churches in, uh, in, in Ireland. 
Um, any comments, Tim, on uh, Sanko? Yeah, well, we used to talk about going, when we were going up the town, we had a we call to go up the street. That's all they said, way up the street, you know? Yeah. yeah. So okay. uh, that's the way they refer to going up the town or up the street. Um, but you, you ma- you've got to mention Bolly Black there, believe it or not. Which oh, no. Oh, we're going to come back to it. Oh, come back to that, right. Yeah, well, absolutely. yeah. No, that's, well, it was up the street. Um, it was said we were going up the town or up the street. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, good, good, good stuff. Pillars. Um, so I'll just say this this probably ranks my favorite building in Lurgan. So this is just in Church Place. So it's not, not too far away from Shankill Church. Uh, so it's not so just, just on the other side of it. Um, so this was um, the town's first cinema, known as the Hippodrome or Grand, uh, was, was situated in here. And it was opened by a, a Samuel Hewitt, who I think we, we mentioned earlier is uh, the owner of the Honeypot Farm. Um, and also the Hewitts who then took over Silverwood House. A uh, lovely, uh, quirky, quirky building, uh, lovely polychrome brickwork. Um, Sunline, as I mentioned there, lots of wee faces you can just see see here as well, just, just in, just, uh, in the, the pillars here. So, so uh, this is Towns for a Cinema, uh, the Hippodrome Grand. Um, I think there was a fire in it though, and I think in the 1930s, um, which led to it being closed. And uh, after which it's uh, the building seen uh, various uses. I think there was a there was a market in here at one point. Um, yeah. a, toy, a toy shop was there a toy shop in here as well. Um, uh, as, as well, there was a variety theatre that I think uh, Willsey Gracie uh, would would have uh, been in. Uh, but today uh, you have the upper stories, which are occupied by uh, uh, Gallery and Campbell uh, solicitors, and uh, the bottom story, which was uh, Sean Green's bookies, it's, it's vacant at the minute. Uh, but again, the the name pillars, of course, coming from uh, the columns, uh, these uh, columns that are uh, sort of uh, ornamented. Uh, but a wonderful building, a listed building, um, adds add an awful lot to the streetscape. Have um, you ever been in the Hippodrome, uh, Jim? No, you only been in the Hippodrome. That's the 19th. No, I, I, remember, uh, <laughs> I remember the market, in it, and it was always referred to as the cinema, uh, the cinema market. Okay. Um, I remember that. Uh, I should have actually, yeah, that's actually something I might include. Actually, the cinema, yeah, the cinema or the cinema market. I remember being referred to that. I remember going there to the market cinema as a wee fellow in the morning, you know. Yeah, uh, good, good stuff. Uh, but it was actually, wasn't it the canteen for the American soldier uh, officers during World War Two? That's right. And I think there's a photograph somewhere of it, isn't there? Yeah, I think there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I have to. Yeah, I have to remember that. I forgot about that. Yeah, excellent stuff. Well, we're into uh, Shankill now. Um, and are you know well, well, Jim. And, yeah. Um, one of the one of the mysteries. So I said there at the beginning that we sort of ignore or not ignored, but we didn't include sort of lost street names like the courts. Um, but one that we did include was the Brigitte, um, because the Brigitte doesn't actually feature on um street directories or valuation books it, it does seem to have been actually just a slang term for um shankle street place would that be right jim yeah that's right shankle street place okay. and, um, yeah. there's a lot of conjecture again over the name uh well this was the irish town you know the area there was the irish town uh you know going back in history that's where the irish if you want to you know the, the sort of not the catholic people were referred to as the irish Mm-hmm. And that's where they lived. That was the Irish town. Um, so one one of the theories was that uh, the, the you can't really see it on the map. Don't think is that is that that line the river? No. Yeah, we, at, the, the, at the back here. Yeah. 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 Is yeah. the river runs through? The river ran through. Uh, it's a bit the Pine River, Jim. At that the period. Pine River. Yeah. So the yeah. Pine River runs runs through that area. And uh, one of the, the theories, anyway, is that there was a bridge over the river, and that the the word brigade is a Scottish word for a small bridge. However, there never really was um, a, a sizable Scottish element to Lurgan. Um, it was always known as an English town. And uh, that area was the Irish town, part of the English town, if you want to call it that. Um, so I don't know why they would have called it a brigade. My theory is that uh, the river the river was very important because it's the river that circumnavigates the graveyard and um, it would have always an important river. And in ancient times, they named important rivers after a goddess called Brigitte. 
Um, in fact, all over Europe, and in fact, that's probably where Bridget Bardot gets her name from, the same goddess. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the goddess Bridget, or Bridget was known all over Europe, um, and St. Bridget takes her name from that as well. So I think the river, the river was called the Brigid. Um, but the, an odd story was that there was a brick factory down there. Um, and there was a brick factory down there. Um, it was probably in that somewhere, a brick field, or brick factory. See what it says, nine, nine four, somewhere around that area, I think it was. Um, and that the brigade referred to the brick factory, or, you know, that's another um, possible name for it. But I'd go for the river being called it. There you go. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, yeah. I, I like the I like the Celtic goddess uh, sort of uh, version of it. Like well, there was a lot of wee rivers were called after that goddess, um, special rivers like so. Yeah, and the Saint Bridget, I think, does she have uh, connections with water as well? Doesn't she? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah so, she does. Yeah. Um, so this here, this here would be the Thornley housing estate today. So this was demolished, I think, in the sixties or seventies, and uh, this, yeah. this, this Thornley would be would be here now in the classic um, mineral, mineral company. Um, it would be around this sort of area. Um, just the other one, Jim. Um, I sort of don't have William Street, but uh, the other sort of court that we, that, or the other name that was mentioned in that earlier sort of um, map showing the courts of Lurgan was uh, the Pluckins, yeah, um, which which would be in William Street, so sort of where Campbell's Pharmacy would be now, or Danny McAvaney's Pharmacy, yeah. or the yeah. motorbike place uh, next to it. Um, it's an odd one. Um, I, my, my sort of thinking on the Pluckins is that. It may be related to linen manufacture because a lot of uh, linen work was done in the home. And there's something knocking about in my head that puck in. I, I would have thought, that sounds like something to do with that as well. But I know there was um, like horses or uh, like a courtyard there for keeping horses and things as well. So yeah. that's what I was told. And there was a wee man in there, like a cobbler or something. He operated there as well. But I think it's something to do with the linen industry itself, you know, where you pluck pluck things out or something like that, you know, um, yeah. maybe um, sagging, you know, something that mistakes made, and maybe some of the embroidery or something like that there, and they had to pluck it out again. I think it was something like that, but I don't, nobody has come up with a plausible idea for the pluckings yet, like, but it's a lovely yeah. name. Yeah, because uh, someone some else mentioned actually it could be plucking chickens, you know, so don't know. I mean, uh, could be, could be. But I, uh, <laughs> Any ideas out there? Let us know. And uh, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Barry, I, I didn't see your comment there. So, David, I bought the old cinema in 1980. Uh, Barry Campbell, very good. Well, you're a lucky man to have such a lovely building. Uh, so you are in, uh, uh, in in your ownership, Barry. Uh, it's, it's really as a cracker. So it is. And uh, Donna, there was a phrase you used much much used to compliment the leading solicitor in town. Say nothing till you see gallery. Okay, very good. There you go. <laughs> gallery was a local solicitor. Uh, yeah. And and so that's why they said it's a bit like um, what, what do you, what do you do the song whatever you say say nothing you know so <laughs> it was like in America they say take the fifth you know <laughs> you should remain silent so um, I was the old saying saying I had to see a gallery which was if you were arrested or anything or, uh, get into trouble or anything that you said nothing until gallery came to see you you know in the prison cell or whatever. <laughs> Oh, very good. That's, that's good. Good, good stuff. Uh, oh, Tracy, my mum says that as, as a girl, she knew the Pluckins as where the home linen workers were. Okay. Oh, uh, that makes sense. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, so, so it is. Um, <coughs> and uh, funny, because I was thinking that, because you also have Weaver's Row here um, in, in Shankill, and uh, there were a few people actually saying why I didn't include Weaver's Row, but, but Weaver's Row does feature on uh, street street directories and things. But again, obviously the name coming from uh, the occupations of the people, so that would make sense with the pluckins. Uh, so it would. Uh, but very good. Thank you, Tracy. Barry says, Barry Campbell says he can tell you how, about how that phrase came about. Okay, so I think, Jim, you just have there. So yeah. Well, <laughs> may understand them, but anyway. Well, that's Barry, you have a different uh, version of it. <laughs> Oh, but uh, good stuff. So very, very, uh, you know, very historic area here in Lurgan Shankill. Probably the most historic area in uh, Lurgan. You got the Shankill graveyard as well, which goes, and, uh, which is uh, Narnie and Ringfort as well. Oh, Tracy, and she's ninety three. Okay, so that's um, coming from someone who'll know about the Puckins. Um, excellent. 
let me speak, okay? So Barry's going to come up on the screen here. I'll see here if I can. Um, okay, just bear with me here. Um, participants. Okay, Barry. So Barry, what will happen here, Barry, is uh, you'll leave and then you'll rejoin and you'll join us up here on screen. So uh, st stay with us. Oh, it is. You know, good stuff. So uh, the other thing, Jim, just uh, speaking about the Pine River, I mean, it also had the name as the Stinker. Isn't that right? Uh, yeah, it was used as a sewer. Um, and, it, you know, when it, it, it run... They run down one side of the town, and the wee courts that you talk about were, were designed so they could go down to get the drinking water out of it, use it as drinking water. But it was also used as a sewer, and when they butchered cattle in the centre of the town, all the offal and all that sort of spilled down in it. So you could see why there was a lot of uh, fevers and, and sickness about the town. Yeah. Um, certainly when it got down to where Capola Gardens is now, it was an open sewer from there on out uh, till the lock. Um, and it, it, it still is, believe it or not. I've been on to uh, the, the uh, water service uh, reporting it a lot of times, mm. trying to get it sorted out, but it's still a sewer at the moment, so it's, it's still the stinker. The stinker. Well, I uh, should note that it's also used to refer to the Windville River uh, that runs through Lord Lager Memorial Park as well, the stinker. Um, so yeah. I think uh, there's a lot to be desired in the waterways and um, waterways here around Lurgan. Um, Barry, um, I think you can speak now, Barry, if you do want to. Can you in. hear me, David? I can, yes, Barry. Hello, uh, Barry. I, Good to see you. I'm not sure can you see me or not. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm up in Donegal at the moment, actually, and I just tuned into this, actually. <clears throat> and just when you start talking about the old cinema, it's, and, uh, and particularly with, um, I, I, I never met John Gallery. He was a solicitor. He died in 1972. And I came to the town in 1973, just after I uh, qualified my local girl from Mahagallan. Anyway, but uh, going back to the say nothing until you see gallery. So do you want to hear this, the, the, the true story there now? Uh, I heard about it um, when I started. Jack Gallery died in 1972. He was an old man and he, 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 worked, he worked up not quite until the day he died, but virtually until he died. And uh, his nephew was, an, uh, was a man about 20 years, about 15 years younger, called Joe McConville, who was an elderly man himself. And I took the business over from Joe, and, and, and no sooner did that than he retired too, and he died a few years later. But anyway, <clears throat> but the same nothing that you see gallery came from a very famous murder trial in 1920, 20 or 21, I can't remember the exact date, called the Guilford Murder. <coughs> Excuse me. On which I've done a bit of research on. The Guilford murder was an, an armed robbery took place uh, uh, when uh, Dunbar McMaster, who were the occupiers of the mill in Guilford, uh, and their wages were uh, paid from uh, the Northern, uh, the Belfast Banking Company in Banbridge, and the wages clerk was a man called McConville. Anyway, <clears throat> And he, he went into, into Banbridge to pick up the wages. It was, it was about £1,800, which was an awful lot of money in 1920, whatever it was. And he was met, he was ambushed. He was in a taxi, by the way. He was in a taxi, by the way. And he was sitting in the back of the taxi, where he was. And uh, they were stopped just at the, where that restaurant now is on the Guildford Road, going out of Banbridge, um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's very distinctive. It was an old It's the Gilbury place. Fair. Gilbury Fair, you're quite right. Gilbury Fair. Anyway, he was called down. They were stopped. They weren't stopped. But there were guys at the side of the road apparently repairing a car. The taxi driver, the guy pulled over. They're looking for a crankshaft or something. And anyway, as soon as they stopped, as soon as the guy stopped him, uh, Mr. McConville was sitting in the back seat of the of the taxi with the wages, the big tin with the wages, all the coins. And the, anyway, and the sooner had they stopped, then they pulled a gun on the driver, mm -hmm. and they shot him and put him over the wall. There's the, the wall to the river band just right beside it. There, it's quite a steep drop. They shot him. They grabbed the gun. They grabbed the they grabbed the money and ran, and they were caught. Eventually, they were caught. I can't, I'm not going into the details, but McConville, who was sitting in the thing, was uh, uh, charged as an accomplice as having set the whole thing up. You know, now he was a Catholic, uh, and this was in the time when the pogroms were, were pretty. This 
pretty heavy going at the very start. I think, I think it, was 19, it was 1920 when I think about just before the Northern Ireland Parliament came into, into being anyway. And he was charged, he was charged in, um, and, and, and he was brought to Dundalk uh, Courthouse apparently. And this young solicitor called John Gallery just started in business in 1919. And he was called down. Now how he got down from Lurgan down to Dundalk anyway. But whatever he said to the guy, he refused to make a statement. So he did. And he said, I'm saying, I'm not saying anything till I speak to Mr. Gallery, you know? Anyway, now I've looked, and that's how the legends start. Now, I have looked at the transcript, the news reports of the, uh, of the trial, which was in Belfast about nine, six, nine months later, you know? I can't see any record of that, but the, the, th the, 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 the two, two or three others who were charged, along with Mr. McConville, they were all uh, who per the per per perpetuators of the people who carried the thing out were actually convicted, you know. Now, they weren't hanged, as, as was the thing. I don't, know, don't ask me why, but McConville got off because he didn't make a statement. He was discharged. And ever since then, ever since then, he, uh, the phrase came out that I'm saying nothing till I see gallery. And that's how the phrase developed, you know, it is. He died himself about 1946. He was a broken man, totally traumatized, totally traumatized by the, uh, by the experience, you know. Uh, and um, uh, I don't think he ever worked again, but he was a Catholic in the Protestant environment. And there were pogroms, there were riots around Dremore and Guildford, largely large as it was. I was a solicitor in my day, you know, what we called it, it was an, it was an ordinary crime at the time. It was non-sectarian, was just out for the money, you know, yeah. and they got it. And the guy, uh, they weren't, I don't know why, but they weren't convicted. They weren't uh, sentenced to death, even though they shot the guy. I never quite looked into that, uh, but he was, but McConville was the one that got off because he refused to make a statement to he saw his solicitor, Mr. Gallery, a young solicitor at the time who, uh, and that's how the phrase developed, uh, Jumbo, you know. Uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, you're right about the pogroms. I think what happened was uh, uh, Smith, the, one of the, maybe both the Smiths, you know, the, yeah. uh, the R RIC man yeah. that uh, was shot at the time. Uh, he was from Bombridge as well. That happened around the time, and I think... Yeah, he was shot down. He was shot down in Cork. That's right. He, brought, he was an RIC senior officer, and he was brought up to uh, Bambridge to be buried. Where he was, you know. And that was all part of the context of that. That was a few months earlier, I believe. You know. Yeah, and then, yeah. so then it was a, a, as you said, it wasn't anything to do with the IRA, but it was believed at the time. Yes, well, it had yeah. been an IRA robbery. Yes. Um, so there, there was a lot. The, the people working in the factories, of course, never got any pay for a long time. Aye, and aye, uh, aye, so there's a lot of yeah. a lot of yeah. uh, rats and pogroms. There, there was a near well, and if you ask me later, I can look it up and tell you. I can't remember his name. From, he was from America, and he'd come back, and he was into horse racing and gambling and that sort of thing. And he, <clears throat> he was caught. He was one of the guys who was in the instant. Now I can't quite remember. Uh, God, I mean, he just caught me in the hop here. I didn't know, uh, but I've done a bit, bit of work as to how he was found out, how he was caught. Uh, I've got the transcripts of the, the newspaper reports of the trial. So I have, after I retired a few years ago, it sort of made it a bit of an interest of mine, you know. Uh, I never quite got around to publishing anything on it. I'm too bloody lazy, I suppose, you know. But this guy, actually, he was released about 1930. No, he escaped, actually, I think. He, anyway, he got out anyway, and he, he ended up being murdered in New York about 1933, 34, some sort of gangland thing. So he did, you know. But the phrase, say nothing until you see gallery, came directly from that trial, the Guildford murder trial. Uh, McConville got off, and um, Joe McConville, the namesake that I, I took over, now, no relation, McConville's a very common name in, in, in the Armagh area. He said, after that, the, the whole world and his wife sent all their business to Jack, this young sister, Jack Gallery. He was the man to get you out of trouble, so he was, you know. <laughs> You know, and he built yeah. it up, and he built, and in fairness, he oh. built up in his heyday a very, very, very uh, uh, non denominational non sectarian practice. You know, a lot of farm Protestant farmers came to his came to his practice, and and I benefited from that when I took over. So I did, you know, you know, really what? very interesting, you know. But his, his office at the time was down the back of the church, seven church, which now an optician's office, and that's where I took over. 
Uh, that's what I took over in 1973, 74, when I actually, and I moved up the town to the, what's now the old, what's called the old cinema uh, in 1981, you know. So there you are. There's a bit of local history for you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you but if you want any more information on that, get in touch with me. I'm, I'm not just, I'm on the holidays here, so I'm sort of <laughs> relaxing mood, you know. No, well, thank yeah. you for tuning in. And that, that wasn't bad for being caught on the hop. I was very interested <laughs> to hear, the other uh, side of the, very interested to hear you talk about the back of the wall, because I lived on the back of the wall, you know. <laughs> it's mostly full of solicitors and uh, retired lawyers and doctors and all that sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, anyway, but anytime we, I go to a pub quiz, we all call ourselves the back of the wall gang, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank okay, you, thank, yeah, thank you, yeah. Barry, for joining us. Good stuff. Okay. So, yeah. nice. so um, I listen, and you carry, you guys carry on. Mm-hmm. That, that's grand. Um, better, better hurry up a bit here because I'm nearly an forty-five minutes here. Jeez, time <laughs> flies, doesn't it? That does. Okay, so moving on, so we're into the, uh, we're into the pound. Um, so this is a, a, an old name. It's actually recorded by Alfie Talon and his. Um, Book Memories of Old Argon, Alfie Talon, <coughs> Alfie Talon being the uh, the uh, pseudonym of um, uh, Pat Smith. He uh, was a Lurgan male journalist and a journalist for Lisburn Star. So he recalls this as a name really from the, 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 the 19th century for the top of Edward Street. Um, uh, you see here again another wonderful image from uh, the National Library of Ireland, part, uh, part of the Lawrence uh, connection. And the name, uh, not surprisingly, comes from uh, the Pound River that uh, Jim just spoke about, uh, the Stinker, um, which uh, runs uh, underneath here, um, underneath actually Hockey's Blacksmith, uh, up, uh, up the Millennium Way. Um, but there is actually uh, an- another reason that Pat Smith gives that it, this area may have been called the Pound, and uh, that's actually to do with the fact that uh, the old cattle pound of El Lurgan um, was actually based in this area. Sort of around here, you just see um, Karen Condenning, uh, the late uh, Karen Condenning. Um, he actually put the side of the cattle pound here. Uh, you just see uh, at Mount Zion House, you just see the, the column here, the towers sort are of just projecting over here. Um, and uh, this uh, cattle pound, it actually goes back to uh, the 1600s. And it wasn't actually built as a cattle pound. It was actually built as a protective bond uh, for the settlers in uh, Lurgan, or the plantation settlers in Lurgan, uh, to flee to, you know, should the town come under attack. And you can actually see it here. And you can actually see it here. This is a, a map in uh, 1703 of uh, Lurgan from uh, Francis Neville's Map of the Glam Bog. A lovely sketch. And you can see Lurgan, it hasn't really changed much uh, uh, from 1703. Still has the same recognizable uh, street pattern. Got Castle Lane down here, North Street, William Street. Uh, this is uh, being Edward Street. But if you just have a look very closely, you can just see a wee square outline here. And this is the cattle pound, or at the time when it was built, it was a you know protective enclosure, you know, for the citizens of Lurgan to flee to, you know, should they come under attack um, by the uh, uh, indigenous Irish. And of course, uh, it did come under attack in uh, 1641. And this uh, then uh, became, a, say, the cattle pound. Uh, Karen Condenning, he sort of put it where uh, Mount Zion House is, and if you look, it's sort of roughly in that area. Uh, but actually, Philip Smith uh, from the uh, the Arc, uh, uh, listings officer of the Historic Environment Division, he was actually suggesting that it might actually be a bit further up, and he puts it actually where the Manor Court, uh, uh, Manor, Manor Court uh, housing uh, house uh, now, uh, I think a fold now, the Manor Court uh, fold would be now, uh, not too far from McDonald's. He says the topography is a much more like a bond site. Um, but anyway, um, it is possible that this term, the pound, uh, might actually come actually from uh, the animal pound or, uh, uh, of, of Lurgan. Uh, Jimmy, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's what Keegan the Green told me. I would go that um, the, the river took its name from the pound. Okay. Yeah. So, and you can see on your map there, the river running right past, uh, past the pound by that square that you're talking about there. Yeah, and he did tell me that's where the bond was. The manor, the manor, uh, uh, manor house place was that was Hancock's house. You know the Brownlow's agent. Yeah. Um, um. But interestingly, the wall that now runs if you go down, uh, what's now called Sloan Street. There, there's a wall down there, um, where the where the there's, there's a school there, uh, Carrick School. There's no wall there, which always intrigued me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so 
uh, it might be something to do, to do with the with the Vaughan, or I'm not sure. But certainly King and Denny told me that's where the Vaughan was there. Um, now, there was Brownlow's Vaughan as well, and I think it, it, it was where the, funny enough, the castle is not shown on that map that they can see there. No, it'd just be off it here, so it would. Uh, uh, so so it would. I'd like to see if the castle's on that map at all, or... Yeah. You know what I mean? It'd be, it'd be interesting to see that. But yes, that's what King, King and Denny told me was there. Well, I thought when he explained it to me, it was more or less where um, he uses uh, pub is there now. Or, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, so just uh, just uh, as you're veering off the Millennium Way there. Yeah, just, just right on that corner. Right. That's where he explained it to me that it was yeah. sort of the side of the convent or between the convent and Okay. Like just over there, that bit there, that's where, where Kieran turned me. It was like, but then um, okay. so, um, you can see that the, what's interesting on that map as well, well is the church, the, the road down to the church. Yeah. Uh, you know, Shackle is actually William Street there. Yeah. That's the main road down it. There is no Shackle Street on it there. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, so it's 1703, so before the church was built here. And uh, yeah. interesting to see the middle road taking shape here as well. Uh, yeah. So it was so as uh, Largan's population grew, um, Brownlow he allowed housing and stuff to be built uh, onto the market house, and it, it sort of later becomes uh, regarded as an eyesore in Largan now, uh, the middle row. Uh, so, so it does. So here you see its very beginnings. Uh, so it does, and then it's uh, demolished in uh, the 18, I think 1885. Um, it, it's completely demolished. Uh, but, but thank you. So um, yeah, um, a lovely term that really ties in to going all the way back to. You know, the origins of Lurgan, uh, the pound. Oh, it um, moving on. Well, you, you mentioned this one, Jim, Minister's Turn. Um, yeah. yeah. The, uh, uh, Google Maps here. So uh, this is a, the, the name for the old Port of Down Road. And uh, Texas name from uh, the uh, Presbyterian Manse, uh, which was built here in uh, 18, 1870. And uh, this would have been for the minister um, of Hill Street uh, Presbyterian Church. Um, I think uh, I think uh, a lot of towns will have their minister's turn or the rector's turn. I mean, and I think in our Port of Down conversation, you know, we had the rector's turn up at Drumcree. Uh, this is what we had. So um, this is uh, Lurgan's uh, minister turn. Uh, the Marrowbone, now this was one um, that uh, David Martin um, gave to me. So the Marrowbone sort of refers to this area. Um, it's sandwiched between uh, Union Street um, Edward Street, and you've got Hill Street running through here, and then you've got uh, New Street and Mark Street and James Street. Um, uh, David wasn't able to shed any light on why it was called the Marrowbone. Um, it, I wonder, it, it's very interesting because if you think of the word Lurgan, it means the shin bone. Yeah. Yes. And I wonder, yeah. I wonder if it anything to do with that, but um, I, I, I turned up a bit of Mythology there that referred to the shin bone uh, Lurgan as the shin bone of uh, Finn McCool's mother in law. Wow, okay, <laughs> so they thought it was lovely, like, but yeah. I don't know. This moral bone could have something to do with that, yeah, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be putting any money on it, like, but there you go. That it might be something to do with that. Yeah, I think there's a, there might be a moral bone in London or maybe Belfast or something. I've heard of it somewhere else before. Yeah, I mean, there's there's one in London, there's one in Belfast actually, uh, but it comes from Marlebone or and uh, the churches churches as well. Uh, so, so it does. Um, I mean, for this, I was wondering, it might possibly relate to a, a shambles or a you know some sort of butchery or something possibly maybe historically in the area. Um, uh, but I can't, I can't really shed any light on it. So if anybody knows, it would be again or anyone who's heard anything, it would be good, good to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, so, so it would. But again, it's it's just just lovely to have it. Um, so thought is um, uh, the, the marrow bone, uh, the marrow bone of Lurgan. So, so that, that's where it is. And this is uh, the one that I knew. This is the only one in Lurgan I knew growing up. Uh, this uh, counter punch or knife point. Uh, this was the name given to Center Point, um, which it was a cinema and bowling complex opened in I think 1988 or 1987. And the cinema closed in 2005, but. And this would have been about as far as we would have got if we were going to Lurgan. You know, we was in Port of Down. You know, we, we, we were really stuck to Port of Down. We went to Craigavon's shopping centre the odd time. And then if we went to Lurgan, then we'd go, we would go to the cinema in Centre Point because it was the only cinema that was about. And in fact, Titanic was the last film I seen there in 1998. Uh, so it was uh, Granny. Uh, granny took me to see it. So um, I said it, it did have a reputation uh, for fights. 
uh, particularly on a Friday and a Saturday night uh, in the car park here. This is where this name uh, Knife Point and uh, Counterpunch uh, came from. Uh, which I think is a brilliant play on the word, uh, center point, I have to say. Uh, again, one of these darkly, darkly comic uh, <laughs> sort of things. Yeah. A bit of humour. Um, <clears throat> McCrory's built that. McCrory's half of people. Hmm. One of McCrory's built it. And uh, of course, they owned the ash the ash bird at one time when we used to call the ash bird the ash tray. <laughs> that was in the mid cut, the ash tray or, or the burn. I think I think the 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 McConaughey's adopted the word burn and they call it the burn now or something. They, uh, the, 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 the they would have got the ash tray or the burn, you know. Yeah, but um, yeah, so um, uh, a lo- lovely name and again another lovely image here from my old American photographs. Yeah, what it is. Um, uh, showing it. I think that's nearly us. So um, we're going to finish just, Jim, with these uh, two expressions, down the tarry or from the tarry. Uh, now, what does that relate to, Jim? Well, that's Lurgan Tarry, really, but the Tarry, yeah. the Tarry Lane uh, runs, that's the Tarry Lane. There's, some people would know it as O'Neill's Terrace. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you go, if you go the opposite direction from where you're pointing across, that way, across the land, that way there's a, mm-hmm. there's an old, the ancient road there called the um, Stony Batter. And of course, Batter or Luther is the road. So, uh, and I'm wondering, was the tarry part of that old Stony Batter? But it goes right then, it comes right the back of St. Coman's graveyard, it comes out right there. And again, it was a, a sort of lovers or couples uh, walk around. There was a beautiful walk right around it. You know, uh, the Lurgan Tarry, of course, was, uh, was a great forest at one time. And uh, one of the Brownlow's son-in-laws, he he got the land and he um, felled a lot of the trees. In fact, there's a, there's a there's a house down there owned by the O'Neills, and it's still called the Wood. And the the, the, the O'Neills were known as the O'Neills of the Wood. So, uh, but the uh, and so, t- is the Irish word for the end of summer, or better known now. As Halloween, so this would have been a place for uh, festivals uh, relating to Samhain. Um, for it, it's interesting that the graveyard St. Coman's is built in it, like, but um, at that time of the year, they believed that the veil between this world and the other world was very thin. Um, so they would have had this. They believed that they could communicate with their ancestors at, at Samhain. And uh, we're going back a long, long time now, way back in the ancient history, like um, going into Celtic times here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Celtic, certainly before the Gaelic times, even, but in the Celtic times, yes. Mm. And uh, that would have been a very special place for them to hold those ceremonies. And there's a lovely, just to your left, there's a lovely big hill there. So perhaps that was the hill that they carried it. There was a little bonfire, of course, this is a bonfire time now, but they would lift a little bonfire then. And, um, as you know, they have Halloween bonfires um, in, in other places now. And we don't really do Halloween bonfires anymore. But they would have, you know, so that's where that tradition comes from, from Sawin. And that's where the name Tari comes from, and Sari or Sarwin. Excellent. Um, if you're from the Tari, Gem, it means you're from the northern end of the town, isn't that right? Is that's that right. right. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I mean, Karen. Uh, God, God bless Karen. But uh, he always used to talk about the Tarry Man. Uh, you know, so this was the, you know, if you're from the north end of the town, you know, the Tarry yeah. Man. So he did. And then he used to also speak of the blo- uh, the Bloch Man, the Bloch Man. Uh, so he did. So this is, um, I think you were alluding to this earlier, Jim, you know, going up the town. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that means you're going up the up the block or up the block. Up your yeah. And uh, that comes from the townland name, uh, Bally Black, which you can, oh, sorry, I've, Quick dad point, okay, but it's just disguised in Bally Black here. So this is a, the town land here in the south end of the town. And what does Bally Black mean? Uh, do you say Bally Black? Well, it, it's the town land of the Flyers, uh, like Ballin the Bla- you know, where uh, Michael Collins was uh, shot a Ballin the Bla- Bla or Ballin the Bla. Well, this is very similar. Bally Black or Bally Black is it's called here. It's interesting that uh, my, my, Ed, uh, my granny's four brothers went to World War One. And uh, three of them were killed, but one of them was a war here. He won the equivalent of the VC, and he wrote a poem uh, called the, the Lurgan Volunteers. 
mm-hmm. about his experiences in the trenches there. Mm-hmm. And uh, he mentions uh, the plane, um, the men from the plane and the men from the black, yeah. from the men from Bally Black, you know, fighting the guy in the trenches. And uh, we, 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 we read it under, we, we got an interpreter to read it out underneath the, um, one of the big monuments in the psalm. And to pronounce the word, I, could, I didn't think she paid him a hardship. The hair stone back my neck because all people with us couldn't pronounce it properly, but she did. And she was, she was actually a German who was a French interpreter, you know, speaking, uh, interpreting English for us, you know. So, and she said the word black perfectly, like, you know. And uh, it was amazing. The hair stone, when, when she read it, this thought it was amazing, like, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's lovely. So you're from from, you know, from the tarry up the block, you know. So um, uh, just 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 great expressions. Uh, so, so they are, from the plane, you were fr- if you were from the plane, you were from Francis Street End or Shankill. Yeah, at area, So yeah, yeah, good stuff. Well, I think that brings to an end of um, most of the ones we're going to cover. I haven't covered them all. Uh, we do have this map that is available if you really like to purchase it at uh, Dan and Crafts down uh, William Street. And uh, JTR Jewelers in their Castle Lane, um, you know, um, which has all the meanings and stuff on the back of it. Um, and uh, I don't know, Jim, is there anything you'd like to finish on, or you know, is there anything you'd like to say? Uh, well, we're probably, uh, you know, there's a brilliant new A. E. Russell sign in William Street, mm-hmm. and we're hoping to have like, a, although it's up already, we're going to maybe have like a wee bit of an odd. Unveiling ceremony maybe on the seventeenth. We have still in the planning process, mm-hmm. so there we may if 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 it comes to yeah, we'll be doing that and maybe having an A Russell tour, um, you know, around around the town, and just just the seventeenth is the day is the anniversary of his death, so we'll maybe do something like that. Um, mm-hmm. But no, that's about that's about all at the minute. Um, well, thank you and. Um... I just want to ask you, thank everyone, everyone out there, thank you for watching. If you have any uh, questions or if you have anything you'd like to come on and uh, if you'd like to join us, you can just uh, stick up a virtual hand or if um, you know, you're know you happy enough, if we've covered everything, um, you know, uh, we will uh, make our apologies. We will uh, say goodbye and let you all back to your uh, night. Um, but I have to say... David? 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 Yes, Barry. Yes, Barry. Just one thing, I come in late actually and I'm thinking of Jimbo here. Free Crew, that area in North Street. Did you mention that earlier on? We did. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, well, I'm sorry. At the risk of annoying everybody, could you just tell me just the background to that? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Jim. Well, well we, 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 it's a lot of conjecture over it. And um, it was a, a, an area of free pasture, a common area. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, one, one story is that if the crews, the, the crews went into Brownlow across the wall, and the Brownlow's estate, the, the old gardener or caretaker there, he would have shot the crows. Um, <laughs> but if they fed in this pasture land, they, nobody touched them and they were, they were okay there. So okay. uh, there were the free crows. But I think the name comes from the Irish. Because uh, uh, the, the, they were saying, they're, they're, I came up with a bit of research there about the free school there um, in North Street. Four percent of the children there were, were registered as coming from living again the wall. Mm-hmm. And so th- those huts again the wall, um, the Irish word for huts is crew, and mm-hmm. free is for like a, a um, what was the word again? Um, you know, like a grassland. You know, yeah. so I think the free crew maybe comes from the Irish. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, okay. so that's where I think it comes from. too. there's a bit of conjecture over free crew, yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Um, there's yeah. a couple of versions of that anyway. Thanks for that. I'm sorry to have to ask you to repeat yourself. <laughs> oh, you're okay. No, no, it's it's, it's a very as, as I was saying, the people from Free Crow are very uh, yeah yeah they're very proud of their the name Free Crow and they were very 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 very, uh, very Free Crow people like yeah yeah you, uh, you talked about Lord Lurgan earlier on and I think it's only worth saying that he he was a the Brown the charge Brown was given a peerage because he voted for Catholic emancipation. When Wellington was the Prime Minister and had great difficulty getting it through, getting it through the House of Parliament, the House of Commons in England, you know, and that was his prize, that was his gift uh, for it. And as you said earlier, somebody said it was a very brave thing for somebody in his position to do. You know, very brave. Yeah, he, he was. He was uh, 
the very, uh, yeah, he died during the famine, helping the poor, really. You know, he was yeah, a good man. Yeah. And he had a brilliant he had a brilliant mind anyway. It was his idea for the lowering of Lac Bay and things yeah. like that. He was always trying to uh, okay. come up with schemes to help the poor. Yeah. Um, you know, drainage schemes and, mm. and things like that. He was a fantastic man and uh, yeah. and a close friend of Daniel O'Connell's actually. Okay. And the two of them died very close to each other. Yeah. You know, help maybe because when when he got the peerage, he felt obliged then to build this big castle, you know, commensurate with his uh, uh, new status. Yeah. And basically, basically took a couple of generations, but basically it busted the family wide open financially that just couldn't support it, you know, and they end up basically selling it for virtually next to nothing uh, in the 1890s. You know? I think that might have been more down to his son. Well, <laughs> well, son yeah, it wasn't him, but it took, it took about three generations, you know, but uh, uh, and that was it, <laughs> you know, but there you go. Anyway, that was very interesting. Thank you, Barry. Um, I've been joined. Uh, Donna, are you? Can you speak, Donna? Are you there, Donna? You might be on mute. Uh, on mute. There you go. There can you go. hear me now? Can hear you now. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You can probably see me as well. Congratulations on a great presentation by both of you. Wonderful stories. Wonderful history. Learning every second. Congratulations on the map. It looks fantastic. Uh, look forward to to getting a copy of it. I uh, just wanted to add one um, story, uh, and it's within my family. Uh, we had the pub at the top of the Castle Lane. It's now the Butchers. It's Keegan's. It's just opposite um, the, uh, what, what do you call it? It's, uh, Walsh's, basically, the International Bar. Famous bar across the road, which maybe it's on the map. It's Fa Joe's, which is a great, uh, a great local tradition. But the pub was long gone, 1973. My grandfather had owned it beforehand, uh, Henry Mercer, and it was known um, politically correctly as the Victoria Bar, <laughs> which is all I knew it as. But fortunately, unfortunately, uh, it was a very, I don't want to use the word unsavory because that's demeaning to the good people who were, lived and, and, and thrived in Castle. And it was known locally because it was a bit of a rough house at some stage. Um, as the swinging ditty. <laughs> and I, I come across a few people who call it that. Um, I, um, I did a bit more research on well, my brother, Michael, who's more the historian than I am. Um, there's a great wee story about that that is, you know, a great story, um, Barry, about, about uh, John Gallery. See nothing, do you see Gallery? My brother... My brother Dermot worked with with, with uh, Barry, gave uh, Dermot his start. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure how many years, Barry, but I um, um, haven't credit, seen you in a wee while, I think, in the golf club. But um, I wanted to share something with you that I, uh, my brother Michael came up with in a little bit of local history terms. We're very f familiar with Buckfast in this town. Very familiar with it. Too familiar, some will tell you. But uh, actually... Um, the whole idea of Buckfast didn't come uh, through nothing. I believe there was an association with the, this wine, this cheap and cheerful wine, uh, slightly different to Buckfast over the years, uh, and it was called Tawny Wine. It was more like a port than a wine, but it was cheap and cheerful and, and available in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And the person who, um, the person who was able to... Um, to tell us a bit more about this, uh, had a song, and it was about Murta Tawny Wine, uh, that Henry Murta, and he was my grandfather, used to sell, and it's a poem. Um, on a Saturday night, I went to Murta's, the weather had been fine and mild. As I passed by, I thought I'd try Henry Murta's Tawny Wine. It continues about him getting the wine, and then he's put into a prison. He's put behind bars, and early next morning, I was waiting on the verdict that they must find. Three months from today, Judge Green did say, for drinking of the tawny wine. But it's the punchline that really gives me uh, pleasure, dare I say, and connection to Buckfast, because it's the next stage after this. If ever I'm spared to have my freedom, let the weather be rough or dry. If it's thirst, I'll die before I'll try a bottle of Murta's Tawny Wine. And it all came from the swinging ditty. Oh, very good. Yeah. 
I think I, I think I do. I was swinging Diddy on the map here. I think I put it. Okay. The name, the name was a reference to the lascivious conduct of some of the clientele. That's how I phrased it. So it was. <laughs> Just didn't see it on the map, David. Thank, thanks for the opportunity and really good okay. presentation tonight. Thank you. So it is. No, thank you, thank you, Dada, for joining us and for sharing that. Um, anybody else have any questions before we? close up uh, Tracy super talk thanks to you both you and Jim totally brilliant. well thank you Tracy for joining us and uh, also for clarifying the puckins for us or rather your mother because um, that was one that was I have to say bothering <laughs> b- b- bothering bother I have to say because c- couldn't quite you know um, it's just nice to get a bit of confirmation on that <laughs> that's what it is so um, that all being said um, I would just direct you if uh, you would like to learn more about the Historical Society, I'd direct you to our website that you'll see up here and uh, also uh, our Facebook page where uh, you'll find out um, our latest events. Um, our next talk will be taking place in August and um, we'll be celebrating the uh, republication of uh, Munchism's um, a booklet of uh, vocabulary and uh, dialect of uh, South Loch Ness. Um, we're sort of putting together a panel for it. Um, we will be joined by Professor Karen Corrigan, um, a professor of linguistics at the University of uh, Newcastle, um, but she's originally from Lurgan, and uh, she's done an awful lot of study on the North Armagh dialects, and uh, including uh, Munchism. So she'll be able to you know, provide a wee bit of insight into why it's such it's such an important collection um, of words. Uh, we'll also be joined by Ian Malcolm, or Dr. Ian Malcolm, for that, um, author of the book uh, Protestants in the Irish Language Towards Inclusion. Uh, some of you may have seen Ian actually at one of our previous conversations uh, in, a, in a March and uh, he's a real great insight in, into language and uh, all that sort of uh, complexity and uh, mixing. Um, and we'll have a couple of other panelists as well. So that will be in August. Uh, just uh, keep, keep an eye out on our Facebook page or if you're on our mailing list, uh, you'll get uh, emailed uh, details uh, about that. And uh, in September, we'll uh, be doing a conversation uh, looking at uh, Waringstown, uh, Marilyn, Donna Cloney, that whole, that whole area um, um, as well. Um, so I think that's, that's everything I have to say. Um, I'll just say th- thank you, uh, Jim, for, for joining me and you know all your observations there. I mean, um, I always learn something new um, you, know, you know, about it. And uh, as I said, th- this place near Map was, was really a, was re- really began with, with you just telling me about the canyon and your, all your childhood experiences uh, in the time. Um, Thank you to, to, to Donna, to, to Barry, uh, to Tracy, uh, to everyone who's uh, contributed there and our questions, uh, uh, Martin as well. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us. And um, yeah, uh, everyone have a good night. Uh, so cheerio. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And then, uh, if I can just, how do I turn this off? Ian. And they brought livelihood to that pub. But it was a rough, tough place.